And welcome back to sort of the Clear Jets podcast for us, Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Well, Michael, the Jets are five and two, um, but I won't lie to you on Monday. It certainly didn't feel like it with the wave of horrific injuries that the Jets were hit with. Uh, we kind of expected that Brees Hall might be done for the year on our last podcast. We were maybe holding out some hope that it would be an ACL sprain or something, but Eliza Vera Tucker torn triceps. Wasn't really expecting that huge crushing blow to the New York jets. Um, it does get a little better this week, this podcast, you know, it's cool. Your jets, but you know, we tend to be optimists on this podcast. You don't want to be too homers. I felt like in the last podcast, I was maybe a little too soft on Zach and, you know, so we want to we want to present things objectively, but at the same time, things are not all doom and gloom. The Jets are five and two, but we'll start with the bad, Michael. On Monday, I mean, you you pretty much went AWOL after the AVT injury, so I don't really know what you spent those those few hours doing. Maybe you had to go just just think about life for a minute and why you chose to be a Jets fan. I know I certainly did, um, but how did you react to to some of the injury news that we got on Monday? No, I'm not gonna lie to you. It was a that was a tough day. I mean, for my mental, I was like. Man, we finally are in this spot where we're competing for the playoffs. We the, we're tied for the second best record in the AFC, and I can hardly enjoy it because of these two injuries. I don't know. It was it was really hard to process. It definitely didn't feel like the Jets had just won their fourth straight game. Um, but the James Robinson trade, I got to admit, lifted my spirits, kind of got me <laughs> back up. as like, okay, okay. Oh, that's a good way to land on your feet, Joe Douglas. I Here like we go. it. Um, and yeah, from there, I think it was kind of an uphill climb. I'm like, all right, look, I can't control the injuries. No one can. It sucks, but everyone deals with them. You got to find a way to fight through and persevere. We're in an amazing spot here with an opportunity that you can only dream of, you know, five and two at MetLife Stadium against the Patriots team that is more vulnerable, more vulnerable than usual. Um, yeah. With an opportunity to really make your mark in the AFC playoff picture here. So it's it's tough you know it, there's no way to sugarcoat it. it's it's gonna hurt but at the same time it doesn't absolutely crush your chances to continue building on what you've done and potentially make a run here to get a playoff spot which is what i think everyone uh, i definitely wasn't expecting to make the playoffs this year i thought it was possible but i didn't think it's not what i predicted um so i think that is it's still a season that can be very successful very enjoyable um regardless it's definitely awful but at the same time you just got to deal with it and move on so uh so yeah i definitely have found my way back but it was tough at first and you know with this win too against the broncos even you know the way that played out you know you get these injuries in the middle of it it's an ugly game quarterback's not playing great and you know for, for most of that game i was just kind of just watching it like all right yay we got a third down stop or whatever <laughs> By, by the time the last, you know, couple of drives of the fourth quarter came, then I got locked back in. Uh, then I was back to screaming with my incessant, let's go, let's go. That's all I ever say during games. Yeah, really. let us go. I don't know yeah, why. Let us you, go. you had that tweet earlier. Just let us go. I want to be freed. Why, um, why did but, that become a thing? I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. I mean. That's from you. You tweeted it. You I know. I know. I'm giving myself credit for the question. Uh, I think it's, <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Tweet us. Why do people say let's go? Um, yeah, but either way, I was back to that by the end of the game. I enjoyed the win. But then after that, you know, all the other stuff comes in. <laughs> but I'm, I'm back to normal now. This is a pivotal week in the Jets history here. I mean, right. just right. hey, hey, just because of the recent history and how low it's been, this is really a chance to kind of turn that. I feel like we say this every single week. But regardless, this is a big game this week and an opportunity to really turn the tide here and overcome all the negative energy of the past week, which is crazy to say, cause they're five and two and they yeah. just won, <laughs> but, uh, but overturn all that really show like, yeah, we're still here. We're still going to compete. And you know, this team can fight through whatever it needs to fight through. Do we blame Elijah for, for changing the juju last week? Cause it, it really did start. It started like, all right, you're, it starts right after the Pats win or uh, Packers win. You're arguably your best receiver is complaining on Twitter. Then he requests a trade. That sucks. And then, like, to your point with the injuries, it, I, they all hit me at the same time because I wasn't checking Twitter. And I said this in the last pod. Don't don't read Twitter during Jets games. It'll it make them so much more enjoyable. For me, but, it was worse because I saw the Brees Hall one first. 
Are we, are that's, we talking that's what I'm during the game? Or yes, like yeah, because because Brees is oh, yeah. down on the turf, and you're like, fuck, that's serious. Yeah, I'm hoping it's a sprain or whatever. And then at that moment, CBS puts up the graphic of AVT out, Corey Davis out or whatever. And I'm like, whoa, wait, they're oh, yeah. all hurt? If we were told that he left the game by the broadcast, was uh, that like what made a point? I think – you know, I I really should have done that before this podcast to go find which play AVT got injured on, but I don't think that he. I think it must have been the last play of a, it must have been on a third down or something because no, he didn't. They never at one point did he like walk off the field or anything. They just while Brees was on the the turf injured, they put up the graphic that said Corey and and AVT were also hurt at the same time. So we got hit with the triple whammy of like, okay, our three best offensive players are all injured right now. Um, yeah, like you said, like that, it is. You know, you want to hear the optimist in me? I know at the beginning of this podcast, I was like, okay, you know, we don't want to be two homers, but here's here's the the glass half full way to look at it. Because the glass half empty way to look at that is like, oh, of course, you know, things are going too well. You knew it was going to happen. Like, a, you know, they're uh, all, it's basically two pro bowlers, maybe, I don't want to say two all pros, but at least AVT deserves all pro this year, especially if he kept playing. And then Brees Hall was certainly on a pro bowl trajectory himself. So like, okay, of course, same old Jets, your two best off. Offensive players are are injured now for the year. The glass half full approach to to look at this would be there aren't any other Jets uh, teams that I can recall in in recent memory that would have won that game with those injuries and the way that game was playing out in Denver West coast trip. I mean, like everything was what wasn't going their way. Their quarterback wasn't playing well. Denver had multiple chances to win at the end. They let him hang around like all the things that you would, it just, it was, setting itself up to be oh classic jets and then yet again they've proved no no this jets team is different and there, there's so much to cover in this podcast michael so i don't really know where to begin i do want to go and talk about zach i want to talk about the james robinson edition um you know the impact of, of losing avt and Brees. but i guess let's just start maybe the glass half full approach of, of looking at this denver game because there's there's a lot that we can talk about in this game and this will probably be a long podcast um let's just start with with the optimistic side of like hey the fact that they pulled that game out with all the adversity that they faced um certainly speaks to to sala and and this coaching staff wouldn't you agree yeah for sure and i think that's a great it's something i didn't appreciate enough while i was watching it because as much as all that stuff you know sucked and everything at the same time every single time this has happened to the jets in recent years you're also stacking a loss on top of it yeah but this time you know they found a way to fight through all that and win the game. And you know, that's not really thanks to the offense, but either way <laughs> they won the game and that's all that matters at the end of the day. So it gives you optimism going forward that, you know, regardless of what might happen to this team, that they have the perseverance to fight through it and, you know, not let it crush their spirits. And just, and in addition to all that, you know, intangible stuff, just fight out, have the talent and the ability on both sides of the ball to, win games you know offense suffered injuries defense picked up for him and I think the offense still does have enough potential to do that for the defense at some point if it can start clicking so uh it, it's still great to see and that that's what winning teams do like like I look at the Titans as an example this is a team over the past few years that I think at times on paper has really not been that great especially this year but and last year they had a crazy amount of injuries but that team wins every single year. I I think they outperform their talent every year. And that's just great coaching and great culture. And it's winning games that you're not really supposed to win. And that's what the jets are doing right now. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's when you get to that point where you're a perennial winning team and playoff contender, it gets to the point where you have the culture and you just have the ability to win games when guys get hurt or win games when you're trailing in the fourth quarter, win games on the road, uh, just being able to win any type of game. And for the Jets in recent years, that, that's kind of been, been their biggest problem. They only really won games when everything clicked. You know, their home road disparity has been huge. They rarely win road games. Um, and then the games they win at home, they really only win if, you know, speaking of the Titans, like that game last year, Titans had a ton of players out. They didn't have A.J. Brown or Julio. Um, then you get games like the Bengals game where you just catch lightning a bo- in a bottle. Mike White is just as good as he'll ever play in his entire life. Hey, so that, that's all I, that that, I think I, I will, I'll put some money on that, that that will be a fact <laughs> <laughs> that that'll be his best game. But, but yeah, they okay. would only win when things were perfect. Like right. the game was exactly. starting. You'd be like, yeah, this is going to be one of those games. Exactly. Are exactly. Win. 
and they would still barely win the game. And then, and then there the uh, the inverse of that would be when there's a penalty in the opening kickoff. You're like, all right, well, we're not yep. winning this one. Um, right. That's a great point. You guys like the outside linebacker class this year. Yeah, <laughs> but that's a too. great. It's a great point you're making though that just their ability to handle adversity is something that Sala has really preached. And the other thing that I really like, and, and he said it at his press conference this week, looking ahead to to this game, because I think it can be hard, especially when you're a team that um, has lost a lot to get complacent. You know, like you win the big one and he said it after the Dolphins game, like, let's make this shit normal. This shit's normal. We expect to win. And I think the team really bought into that message. And then he had the, you know, quote this week where he talked about, you know, he essentially the mindset going into every, every game is that championship moment, you know, and he's even said, we want championship practices, but on a, on a game level, every single game they look at and they find that motivation, they make it big. They don't make it too big, you know, in the sense of if they lose, it's not devastating, but you know, and every coaching staff has maybe trap games or games they overlook or they'll lose games they shouldn't or whatever. And that might happen to the Jets this year. But even just the way that they framed uh, this Pats game of they want revenge for for them, you know, being up 40 and throwing deep on them. And what was the final score that that second Pats game last year it was like 54 to 10 or something. Yeah. Um, just every week they find that motivation and they find um you know, ways to get themselves uh, amped up and to fight through that adversity. Because yeah, there's not another Jets team that I, you know, I've watched since, you know, maybe the Rex teams. Um, and even those, the, even those teams, like, you know, sometimes, I mean, they had that dog in them, I guess in, in 2010, they had a few fourth quarter comebacks with, with San Antonio Holmes. So I shouldn't say that, but from 2011 to now, a team to go on the West coast at that altitude to be playing that ugly of a game to lose all your best players on offense they don't win that game. And the fact that the Jets did is something you can speak to. And also, I don't want to hear a damn about the Jets uh, facing backup quarterbacks anymore. After, first of all, obviously they had Flacco for three games. And then now with the ABT injury and the Brees Hall injury, you know, the Jets have at least, uh, you know, we can we can no longer accept that as an excuse for the Jets being good because they have faced, uh, certainly this week, a ton of adversity. We're going to talk a lot about the Pats game, obviously. Um, because it's a huge one. Uh, Michael and I are both going to the game. Very excited for this one. I think it should be a, a great crowd. The debut of the Black Helmets. We'll save the uniform talk for the end uh, of this podcast, but it's a big week for us, Michael. Um, so let's 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 put a pin in the Pats game and let's come back to the, to the Broncos game for now. Um, we talked about, okay, the, the optimistic side of things, like the fact that they pulled through this type of game speaks to, to the character of the locker room and the adversity and Robert Sala. But the bad in this game, and there's a lot of it, and it, pretty much all on offense. I mean, there's a, there's a few drives for the defense. So they don't look too hot. But starting with the quarterback, and I said at the beginning of this podcast, I was I was way too soft on Zach on, on Sunday's podcast. In my defense, in my defense, after the Brees Hall injury, you know, I don't really – I don't drink that often, especially I don't really ever drink during Jets games. I'm at a sports bar. Brees Hall goes down. I'm like, all right, give me a gin and tonic. So I had, you know, not that many. I was, you know, but maybe the way I percepted or took in the game and then got on the podcast was a little too flowery. Uh, Cause when I went back and rewatched, I was like, Ooh, okay, that didn't look good. Okay. That didn't look good. And then to our point that we make on all the post game podcasts, okay, well, it's hard to evaluate quarterback play without seeing what's going on down the field. So then when the, co the coach's film comes out, Michael, then you see, okay, you know, the, the Packers game, you could say uh, it wasn't a, a good, great game from Zach, but there was nothing open. This Denver game was a little bit different. So when you sat down and you watched the, the coach's film um, and, and you, you watched Zach's performance, what did you take away? Yeah, I think you said it right there. That That's a big difference between this one and Green Bay because on TV, I think both of those games looked pretty similar. I mean, the stats are similar, no touchdowns, no turnovers. You get about 100 yards, whatever it is. But And, you know, both of them had ugly plays where, you know, he's scrambling around, whatever but you can't really judge any of those plays without watching them. And in the green Bay film, you could see like, okay, he definitely wasn't great. There's some throws he could have made um, some risks he shouldn't have taken, but it's not terrible because there's really not a ton for him to do. The jets were getting clamped in that game, but in this game against Denver, not the same situation. There were a lot of plays that he really could have made. And that's not to say that he was entirely at fault for the offensive struggles because um, the offensive line was pretty bad in this game. And, you know, they botched a lot of protections. They do not have answers for Denver's blitz packages. So they were bad. There, were, there was a lot of plays that was on the offensive line for sure. And, you know, some of those scrambles that you saw from Zach were justified. And it was him doing a good job dodging a sack and 
extending the play, trying to make something happen. Some of them were good. And that's the thing. You have to evaluate those on a case-by-case basis. I feel like there are two sides with the Zach Wilson scrambling. You know, some people think he's, you know, dodging sacks, trying to make a play. This is a plus. We shouldn't be criticizing him. And then some people think this is terrible. You're taking risks. You're playing backyard football. You got to get this out of your game. Both of those things are true, depending on what the play is. Like uh, the play where he almost fumbled the ball. That was trying. That was actually a little bit of both because at first, you know, there was a free rusher and he dodged it. That was great. Then after that, Corey Davis is wide open in the flat with no one for 20 yards after him. And somehow he doesn't see it, even though it's on the left side where that concept is going towards um, because he's still focused on the, the rushers and trying to make the next guy miss. Then he does a little bit too much, does another spin and nearly fumbles the ball. So there's a little bit of both on that play. Some of them, you know, he would scramble, get pressured immediately, scramble, then try to make something happen, then throw it away. That's a good play. Um, so there's a little bit of both. But um, but overall, outside of the offensive line, there were still too many plays where he really should have been able to make the play because it's not like he was pressured in every single play. It was too much for sure. But when the pocket was clean and there was a play to be made, he wasn't making those plays, you know, from the Missy Uzama to and granted that one was slightly pressured but it was a wide open throw and he drifted back when he didn't really need to um but from that miss there was a short slant to mims that he threw behind him that was a clean pocket um there's a third down play in the first drive where garrett wilson was wide open but again he kind of is not willing to stand in the pocket and it's kind of jittering around and he missed that uh first play of the game to Corey davis they had a dig route on the right side that was open and he airmailed them from a pretty clean pocket. So yeah, there were a lot of plays in this game where there was something to be had and he failed to capitalize on it. Uh, so, so it's never black and white, you know, the offensive line wasn't good. Some of the plays were their fault, um, but there were also at the same time quite uh, too many plays that he missed on this game. So I think he's pretty bad in this one. Uh, and it, it puts him in a weird spot now through four games because yeah, through, through two games, I really liked where he was at. I mean, we were thrilled. He had a yeah. great comeback against the Steelers that I think made that a solid game overall. The Dolphins game was, you know, low volume of passes, but he was fantastic in terms of his efficiency and consistency. Um, then, you know, you have the Packers game, which is a down game, but not terrible, like we said. But now you throw in this game, and now four games in, it just kind of feels like just as much of a roller coaster as we saw last year. So, uh, that's why I think this is a big game for him this week. It obviously doesn't make or break anything. It's one game, but uh, at this point, you're kind of in that little teeter tottering spot where it's like, are you improving? Are you not improving? Right. So I think if he could salvage it right now, especially considering the injuries and the increased pressure that will, will be on him, uh, I think the timing, especially this is also his 18th career game. So essentially starting a second season in terms of, you know, second set of 17 games. Uh, considering all that, you know, if you could come out this week and have a good game, then I think that puts him right back on the track where you want to be, where, you know, improving in second season, not a superstar yet, but just a good, solid middle of the pack quarterback. And then maybe you can become a star next season. If he can have a good game this week, I think it puts him right back in the spot where you feel pretty good about him. But it is in a weird spot right now, considering this uh, Broncos game and then the not so great Packers game. So, uh, plenty of time for him, but uh, this was a this was just a worrying game in a few different a uh, few different ways. Yeah, like to go back to our previous point, talking about wow, this team you know knows how to fight through adversity or through rough starts or whatever. Zach, not necessarily, and Robbie Sabo is is talking about this as well. He kind of has like a, that switch where it's like if he's on, he's on, and you've seen it in a lot of his best games. And that doesn't mean like he doesn't have bad starts and then he turns it on. Like the Pittsburgh game is a great example. Um, where, you know, he, uh, even then, I guess he scored a touchdown on that, on that, was it the second drive he had or the third drive? He, he scored a first quarter touchdown. And, and so it, maybe that gave him some momentum, but if he can't get comfortable, it, it does seem like it, it does seem like it, it takes him, uh, a while to, to get comfortable or sometimes, you know, like on Sunday, he never did get comfortable. And look, you could say a few things on that one Denver has a, an amazing pass defense Two, He messed his favorite weapon in, in Corey Davis, his, personal protector and AVT and the life and heart of the offense in Brees Hall. So it, it makes sense why maybe he wasn't able to get comfortable, but like you said, first play of the game, he airmails the pass. 
it's like that kind of sets the, the tone for the rest of the day. And we haven't seen too many instances outside of what the Pittsburgh game, maybe the Titans game. Cause I guess he threw a pick to, to open up that game. We haven't seen many instances where he's rebounded after a rough start, I guess I would say. Um, but I, you know, I think you've seen some improvement in that area. Cause I guess the Packers game, I don't know. It just seems like he's, he struggles to get comfortable in games. Like he has a lot of slow starts and, and this season you've kind of seen, you know, just honestly, just referencing the green Bay and the, uh, the Pittsburgh games, he's been able to get it together in the second half, but this game, when he's missing three of his best players on offense, he wasn't really able to do that. I still think he made a few nice plays. Like you can't act like this was Darnold seeing ghost level bad, but he certainly looked like a rookie. And like you said, that fumble probably should have been a fumble and the Jets don't win the game if, the, if that's a fumble. And so he could have cost in the game with that play. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm more on the side of, of all that hero ball stuff. Like I'm not going to criticize it too much. I think if you run out of the pocket immediately and, and, um, you know, I've seen other people point this out on Twitter, but the there's one play in particular where nickel blitz coming off the right side and and he identifies it immediately and he rolls right right away. Uh, and just because he trusts his ability to get it outside that nickel corner um, and be able to make a throw or a run for or whatever. And so he leaves the pocket immediately. But if he was just able to stay in the pocket or maybe step up, he had two guys that end up getting open for a touchdown. And so part of that, I think, also is he doesn't trust his offensive line. He doesn't really want to get hit. And then, yeah, I mean, there's times where I don't know if, how do you feel uh, LaFleur has done in terms of getting him comfortable early in games? Because like, yes, I get the argument like, okay, we have to baby this guy his entire career. And it's like, all right, no, he's in year two. Like you said, he's played 17 career games, but it, it feels like other young quarterbacks, not that Zach doesn't get plenty of baby throws. I mean, this game in particular, in the last two, they've, they've done a lot of underneath stuff, a lot of screen passes. And by the way, that stuff does look a lot better. I mean, Considering that was a big sticking point for him last year, I think it does deserve some props. But how do you feel like LaFleur has done early in games getting Zach in a rhythm? Because I feel like there's better ways to do it, like getting him on the move, giving him those um, those flood concepts and those those – basically, when he's able to play without thinking, I think he starts to get comfortable. He starts to play freer. He starts to play loose. That's the point that Robbie Sable made about him in, in the fourth quarter against Pittsburgh is, you know, look, the team is winning with him right now. They're four. No, the defense is playing lights out up until last week. The, I mean, actually, even with Michael Carter, the running game is, is dominating. And so Zach has been playing not to make the big mistake. And so you can see he's thinking about everything. He doesn't want to turn the ball over, which is a good place for him to be at. But in the Pittsburgh fourth quarter, it's like, all right, well, you're down 10. You got to go for it. And then he was able to play a little freer and he really just let that thing sling. And, you know, they get his best quarter of his career. So how do you feel two sides to that question, how LaFleur has done in terms of getting him comfortable and then how Zach has demonstrated his ability to get comfortable in games. Cause it does seem like when he's just able to think a little bit less and he's just able to be freer with the football, good things happen. How do you feel about that? I mean, for me, I, especially in this Broncos game, I don't, I don't put a ton of blame on the floor. I actually kind of like how he came out in this Broncos game. Um, I mean, watching it on TV at first is like, oh, why are you passing top pass defense, bad run defense, blah, blah, blah. But that exact expectation is why he came out throwing. Right. Is because, you know, the Broncos were playing cover one. They were manning up on the outside, bringing the safety in the, uh, the strong safety in the box. They're like, go ahead, throw at us. We dare you to. And so he did. And he got Corey Davis open. You know, he cleared him out with Conklin on the seam. Davis comes underneath over the middle, and there's the throw. Got to make it. So I think, right. you know, it kind, of, it kind of goes both ways. You know, if people will say, like, why aren't you giving him easy throws? Then they'll say, why don't you let him air it out? Do you trust right. him? So I think it's never – it does, never always looks, like, super easy. He's not – I guess that's where a lot of the frustration comes because, like, let's be honest, this offense doesn't – always look exactly like the 49ers offense in terms of the past game like <laughs> i think it's looked just, like the 49ers offense like twice yeah run run game sometimes you can see it but past yeah. game like you know these super easy throws dialed up over the middle where you know garoppolo just rolls out and dumping even off with, to people even with flacco it looked different yeah so it, i guess to that degree hasn't looked like it but at the same time the throws are there and if you can't make them it's it's hard to work around that so uh right now i don't put a ton of blame on the floor for that. I mean, there are other things in this game that could have been better. Like, you know, the protection against the blitzes was not good. So could he maybe have 
kept his tight ends in a little more frequently because Jets didn't do a whole lot of that in this game. And there have been games where they kept their tight ends, uh, their tight ends into block pretty frequently. But in this game, they didn't seem to do that a lot. So maybe a little bit more of that, you know, just finding ways to beat the blitz. But he did call five screen passes in this game. You know, he did adjust and start flicking that ball out there pretty quickly. And you know, some of them worked, some of them didn't, but he was calling them. So, uh, and the, I think his run game play calling has been really good this season. Uh, he's been creative. He's been establishing things one week and building off the next. Like in this game, we actually saw him kind of use a Brees Hall touchdown last week. Uh, I think it was Carter who ran it. They kind of did the same action and they actually ran the ball, you know, which they put on film last week, but it was clearly supposed to be a, um, you know, a toss back to Garrett Wilson, but they worked off that and they actually handed the ball off. And I think it was a pretty solid game by Carter. So I kind of like, I'm on the LaFleur bandwagon right now. Yeah, I no, believe no, I, in him. I don't necessarily mean that as a criticism of LaFleur, because I, I agree with you. I think that he's the most creative offense coordinator the Jets have, have had, certainly since I've been watching him. Um, do you feel like it kind of to your point? Okay. And, and this might lead us into one of our next topics because Michael and I were talking, okay, what, what's different about the first two weeks and the last two weeks in terms of how the defenses have played the Jets? And there's not too much different, but there's there's one really important point. And I guess, you know, when we talk about, okay, can LaFleur do a better job of getting Zach comfortable? You're right. Maybe that doesn't just mean throwing short because, like, yeah, the last two weeks he's been throwing around the line of scrimmage pretty much every pass. But maybe getting Zach comfortable means taking a deep shot early in the game trying to dial up a one-on-one or just giving him an opportunity to air it out, get that out of his system um, or even, you know, getting him on the the move at the read option or, you know, other, other ways to make him more comfortable than, than I guess some of the short passes or the screen passes or stuff like that. It just seems like it's either screen or, you know, a dig route or something over the middle that he has to read. He, I think he does a nice job with the RPOs when they get those involved, but um you know, you've talked about it a lot in terms of, uh, or we talked about it a lot before the podcast in terms of the coverages that the Jets are facing and how they're going to have to open it up to change things for themselves. I think a shot might do wonders in terms of opening that up, but even maybe just getting Zach more comfortable himself. Yeah, I, that's actually actually a really good point because you think back to some of his best games in his career and what gets him going? I don't think it's the easy throws that gets him going. It's when he does something big, that's when he really gets the confidence. Like, Titans game that didn't have the best start but then he hits that big out route to Corey Davis about 15 yards I think he hit another one right on the other side of the field so it's when he really starts slinging it that he kind of gets the confidence then the Steelers game you know fourth quarter comes around you gotta air it out and it was the big throws that he kept chaining together it wasn't let me check the ball down and now I'm confident because I have three completions in a row or whatever it was I'm making it was him showing himself that he can make these plays and then he gets the confidence to do it. So I I actually think some of these aggressive plays are maybe better to get him going than some of the easy throws. Um, And that's what he tried LaFleur tried to do against Denver. So, uh, and and I think you have a guy in Garrett Wilson, who's maybe perfect for that, you know? Yeah, for sure. And and that's until getting to the numbers. And this is something that uh, a point you brought up. So I wanted to look into the numbers to, uh, to see how it was reflected, but uh, the coverage his teams are playing against Wilson since he came in. They're playing a lot of single high, a lot of man coverage. Um, about three quarters of his pass attempts have been against single high coverage. The league average is only about 53% this year. So teams are really challenging him. They're bringing an extra man into the box. They're playing man coverage on the outside. Just one safety over the middle. And they're like, we don't really think you can beat us. And in the Steelers game, first two games he did. He actually had really good numbers against single high coverage the first two games. He was passing for over eight yards per attempt against single high coverage over the first two games. But last two weeks, that's gone way down to under five yards per attempt. Um, so teams are going to continue to do it because they want to stop the run, and they don't think that the Jets can hit the deep shots to punish them uh, for playing that type of coverage. So I think that would help a lot if the Jets – can come out and hit these deep throws early in the game because, you know, it'll, it'll back the defense off. It'll open up your run game. It'll get Zach's confidence going. It'll get the receiver's confidence going. Right. Um, Cause right now it kind of feels like it's a one dimensional offense. Like we're, if we're running the ball. Well, we're going to move it. And if we're not running the ball, well, we don't really have an answer, but if they could early in games kind of attack deep and down the sideline, even if 
you're not hitting the throw. I think just kind of showing the threat of it can can do a lot because Jets really haven't attempted any shots down the sideline either. They did the one to more against Green Bay, but in Denver, I don't recall seeing any. In, in, in fairness, in fairness, yeah. they did end up. They didn't have more. I didn't even throw yeah, that in right. terms of, of why Zach wasn't comfortable, but they didn't have more. Davis goes down as his number one right. favorite receiver, and then ABT goes down, which definitely affects, you know, the uh, his his trust in his offensive line. It's also another argument for putting, you know, and by the way, when we say put Elijah Moore in the slot, that doesn't mean Garrett Wilson can never play in the slot. I know Robbie right. and I were on the podcast last week, and both those guys can end up playing slots at different times. But when you want to dial up a deep shot, do you really want it to beat Elijah Moore deep down the field? I mean, I'm not saying that he can't do that, but who would I rather be throwing a ball 50 yards down the field to? It's Garrett Wilson, because I have a much higher faith in his ability to high point it uh, or even just have the catch radius to go and get a back shoulder. Or, I mean, there's just so many other advantages that I think Garrett Wilson has physically over Elijah Moore in those downfield contested catches situations. And Elijah Moore, I think all of his strengths, you know, a lot of them over the middle, intermediate stuff, short stuff. He can do the deep stuff, but putting him in the slot and kind of tying it back to what we're saying, though, it's like if you want to open it up and go deep, maybe it should be to Garrett Wilson. You know, maybe it shouldn't be to your 5'10 slot receiver that you're playing at X. Now, I I still there's still a lot of stuff I want to say about Zach, but we'll go with the natural flow of this podcast here. Um, if Corey Davis can't go, though. I think Elijah Moore is probably still going to be the X receiver. And even if he, he can go, we might still see Elijah Moore on the outside. Um, how do you think the Jets handle uh, Elijah's? I mean, I know we, we still want to talk about this Broncos game, but how do you think the Jets in their game plan and in terms of their long-term vision for Moore will respond to his trade request? And then maybe what we've seen from this Jets offense the last few weeks. Yeah. I mean, with Moore out, Garrett Wilson did kind of take his place and he played more on the outside he had 65 percent of his snaps on the outside so i think that's a sign that maybe the jets are going to lean towards what we've kind of been asking them to do and and michael floor did say to the media on uh on thursday uh he kind of hinted at it i think he was asked about it and he said it's something they're considering so it's something we could see and like you said it's it's not about more is in the slot every play wilson's outside every play everything is interchangeable you know even right now, Moore has been playing 20% in the slot. Wilson has been playing uh, 40% outside. So, you know, they're, they're moving. They're getting their reps in both spots. It's just on an overall level throughout an entire game, you feel like they could be more effective if they're leaning right. towards a certain role versus only doing that occasionally. So, yeah, I think more in the slot is the way to go. Garrett Wilson, the outside is the way to go. That's how you can threaten teams more and I think that's another big part of the the cover one stuff is not just Zach but I don't think teams are threatened by Elijah Moore on the outside I really don't and especially yeah. uh you know with what's on film this year you look at that Bengals game with the Jets did give him some shots when contested balls he couldn't do it um so I don't I don't think teams are afraid of him on the outside either so it, yeah that's that part of why I think they get that well and when you want to look at okay well what's different between these the first two weeks in the last two weeks the secondaries that the jets faced against pittsburgh and miami right. and look there there are players on on miami and pittsburgh that you know minka fitzpatrick is arguably the best safety in football or one of the best safeties in football at least uh but miami was but their corners aren't that good and miami was down their starting corners and, and howard and jones and then you face the packers and the broncos who have i mean jair alexander and patrick patrick Sertain are both I mean, at the very least, both top five corners. Certain might be the best corner in football right now. And do you, would you put Alexander in, in the top five? Does he does he crack your top five, or is he just outside of it? Uh, he's up there, top five to ten. Uh, he was very impressive against Garrett Wilson. That's yeah, for and, sure. and the the point is, is like, okay, how do you beat man coverage? Well, first of all, your receivers have to be able to separate, and and they did more so in in the Denver game, surprisingly, considering everybody who was out. Um, but the last two weeks in, in particular, I think the Jets and Zach Wilson has struggled because, yeah, when you're you're going up against a man defense who has great shutdown corners and they're locking down your receivers, it's hard to get things going as an offense. But I think that's, you know, to everything we're saying, all right, teams are playing a lot of single high man coverage. You got to open it up. You got to take the shots because not only will that open up things for, for Zach, but it'll open up things for your running game. It'll help things. It'll help your play action game. I think it'll just open things up for this Jets offense, but it comes down to will Zach, you know, can the offensive line hold up? And then also will Zach stay in the pocket? You know, cause we saw a few other of those times where like, as I alluded to earlier, where he was quick to, to break the pocket. 
And, you know, I said there was that that video of him that that went viral on Twitter where it was like a compilation of him making a bunch of guys miss. And the guy who tweeted it, it was kind of like, it kind of came off as like a shot at Zach Wilson to be like, you know, look at this idiot, you know, fumbling around playing football or whatever. But it was kind of an impressive highlight reel. Let's just be honest here. Um, but I agree with you, Michael, that it, there's a fine line. Like all that stuff he's doing, you you don't really want to take it out of his game because the hope is, and you haven't seen it turn into really anything that productive, but the hope is, is that eventually you'll get those Mahomes types of throws because how often have you, and like, when I throw that out there, I'm not saying Zach Wilson will be Patrick Mahomes or that the hope is that he'll be Patrick Mahomes. It's just that improvisational ability that Mahomes brings. And there are a few other quarterbacks that bring it. You know, you're hoping that his ability to make defenders miss behind the line of scrimmage will turn into him being able to turn what should be a a 10 yard sack with Joe Flacco into a 50 yard touchdown. Um, And he hasn't really been able to transform those into big plays. A lot of times, though, he's been able to evade evade the sack and throw the ball away, keep the Jets alive, and then they can hand it off to Brees Hall and and keep the the sticks moving. That is a big difference in the offense between him and Flacco is that Flacco's taking that sack, and then all of a sudden you're in in second and 17. So I get, you know, when I was at that sports bar, plenty of Jets fans, when he started running around, I heard a lot of groans. I go, what is he doing? Throw the ball away. And I get it, but at the same time, you you kind of don't want to take too much of that out of him. Like you want it to be like, all right, Zach, you have to stay in the pocket, you know, at the start of the play. You can't just be leaving at the first sign of trouble. And I get it. Your offensive line has been a, you know, a revolving door in front of you, but those are the types of plays that you want to supplement your game. They can't be the entirety of your game. You know, like Mahomes has two or three of those plays every game, but he's not doing that every drive. And when you're seeing Zach do it every drive, it's generally not going to be a good thing unless he's able to turn those into to plays downfield like we saw at BYU. But he hasn't been able to do that yet. Um, I'll tell you, though, the secret to if you think Zach isn't playing well and you're worried about the future of the Jets quarterback, just pound a few G&Ts. You'll be amazed how different your perception of his game is. Um, all right. I guess we'll we'll move on from Zach. I quickly want to okay, expand what ahead. you said about his scrambling. Yeah, um, but yeah, it, it's not something you want to take out of his game. It's, it's a very high upside trait. Like you mentioned that highlight reel that someone put together of you know all his wild scrambles this year. It's hard to watch that and not think like, you know, regardless of the fact that the results were pretty ugly in those plays, it's hard to watch that and not come away with this guy actually is pretty talented in that if he can put it together, there could be some great results on these plays. So you don't want to take that away. And the hope is that eventually he does a, a better job capitalizing, but it, it all just comes down to, you know, finding the balance of when should I do this? When shouldn't I do this? And right now he's kind of struggling to find the balance. Sometimes it's a great thing that he does it. He dodges a sack. He throws the ball away. Um, it's all well and good, but Sometimes he does a little too much, an extra spin when he doesn't need it, um, running towards a blitzer when he doesn't need to, um, trying to bail out of the pocket when there's an open throw if he just stands in there. Um, So it's a time and place thing. He's just got to find that balance. It does seem like they've coached into him. Like he gets to the the line of scrimmage, you know, identify what he thinks he's going to see pre-snap. And then it kind of seems like if what you see is not really there, run. Use your athleticism because that is something we haven't really seen too much of from Zach. And we've seen it in spurts. I was really looking forward to seeing it more this season. And then I think that preseason game, I mean, you saw right off the bat, even on the play that he got injured, it was impressive mobility. Um, I think the Jets were thinking that he was going to run a lot more this year. And then he obviously has the knee injury and that maybe threw some, some things off, but he's still using at his athleticism the, the worry is is when you have a guy who's playing like that and and jumping and doing 360s and spinning around and doing backflips behind the line of scrimmage that he's gonna get hurt again um but i, I think the thing that it, there's a really funny tweet from one of the the hosts of the uh the oklahoma drill podcast and jets x factor so i'm gonna steal it but it's from at zazzy jets with z's um and he said uh, i liken zach wilson to an escape artist who escapes from the straight jacket but still drowns in the tank and i think that's a pretty good uh metaphor for for where zach is at right now where it's like the the guys that he's making miss behind the line of scrimmage that's legitimately very impressive those are right, right. the top one percent of of athletes uh in the world right now that he's he's making you know look like idiots fall over and trip over themselves and juke out and create space um you know, instantly, but then it's like, you haven't seen him finish it. It's like, it's like the guy who, uh, you know, uh, in basketball, 
Michael, maybe this is you, dribbles up to three-point line, crazy dribble move, cross him over, break the ankles, stare him down, and then air ball. Like, you got to hit the three if you want the, the crazy <laughs> yeah. ankle breaker to count. Um, and so that's where Razak is out. So Razak is at. So you can criticize him airballing the three, but you don't want to be act like that ankle breaker was the, you know, the thing that was always wrong with that play. It's like, there's a time and a place it has to supplement his game, but that's a legitimately, like you said, that's an elite trade he has right there. How many quarterbacks do you think are better and more elusive behind the line of scrimmage than, than Zach Lamar Jackson, Kyler Murray, Mahomes, Allen, probably too. Although it's a different type of, of, Mobility. Different type. He can use yeah. his strength to a Yeah, it's guys. his size and his strength, but you'll get but it to him. Kind of the same purpose. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's a few others, but in terms of, of what we've seen from Zach, especially this season, you know, he may be a top three guy in that in, in that department. We have, but until you see him turn those plays into highlights, that won't be re- that, you know, that won't be recognized. So that's kind of how I fall on it, where it's like I recognize that it just because he's making guys miss and he's spinning around and it's looking cool and it's fun to watch when you're drinking G and T's. But I understand that unless he's turning them into big plays, you can't really celebrate that. But I do think you should look at it with the nuance of like, Hey, 17 games into his career, he didn't really break out at BYU until his third year, give him time, let him develop. And those plays might turn into something. And then you're like, wow, we have a quarterback who can turn a a would be sack into a touchdown, you know, who can elevate the team around him. Um, We're not there yet. But I'm just saying he, he's you see just a glimmer of hope in what he's able to do. Like Daniel Jones can't do that. Um, but Daniel Jones is, you know, one NFC office player of the week this year. So let's just let him develop. I guess that's the point. Um, I guess we're, we're done with Zach for, for now. We'll, we'll talk about what how big this Patriots game is for him uh, in a bit. But I, we, do, we do want to get through some of this Bronco stuff so we can get to the Pats game. Um, you know, I'll let you do a little maybe not as much of a victory lap, but you were talking a lot last week about what the Jets game plan should kind of be going into Denver and how they should, they played a lot of 12 personnel against green Bay and that, you know, given Corey Davis's run blocking. And by the way, he went out and they still did this. The Jets should play a lot more 11 personnel. Denver struggles against the run against 11 personnel. You called it. That's exactly what the Jets did. Um, I mean, what did you think of, about their game plan? I know you like LaFleur, but just that in general, their ability to run from 11 personnel, you know, the way they're using their personnel and offense and, and utilizing the tight ends, because since Flacco has been gone, it, it does kind of seem like the tight ends have for the most part disappeared from this offense. They still make a catch every once in a while, but um, just what do you think about their personnel groupings and, and how they've handled things so, so far? Oh well, yeah. And in the Packers game, they used a season high for 12 personnel. It really kind of became their, main package they used about i think 35 percent in that game which which is pretty high for 12 personnel most teams are well below that and that was their highest mark of the season and they use it relatively frequently so um they pumped that way up the 11 personnel was down and and by the way 12 personnel one running back two tight ends two receivers 11 personnel one running back uh one tight end three wide receivers you can tell by the first Whatever the number is, it's running backs and tight ends. So if it's 11, one running back, one tight end. Um, and then it adds up to five eligible receivers. So three receivers to that. 12 is one running back. Are right, you complicating tight ends. it? You're complicating I'm, it. I'm just, you, just you lost explaining. me. I'm just <laughs> you lost explaining. me. <laughs> it's literally just the two numbers. No, I know, I, no, I know what it yet. is. I know okay. what it is. But you're explaining yeah. it if there's listeners who don't. Yeah. All right. 12. Yeah. I'm just trying to write a glossary. It's not, not ever. I don't think everyone knows it. So. But yeah, the, so basically that there's a lot more two tight ends against Green Bay than they've used all year because it was a you know run heavy game plan. Um, but going to the Broncos game, I thought, you know, they their numbers against stopping the run against 11 personnel were a lot worse than against 12. And plus, I think, you know, you want to it's a great pass defense. So kind of want to have more weapons to beat that. So it's like, you know, let's find a balance here. We don't need to pump the 11 personnel to an extreme degree because you know the two tight ends was working but let's get it up a little bit find, try to find like a happy medium and they did kind of do that they went back to 59 percent 11 personnel which is middle of the pack for the jets this year earlier earlier in the year they were at 65 percent most of the time sometimes 70 one game i think the Bengals was 80 um and then 12 personnel was down to 21 percent in this game which is still one of their higher numbers but not close to Green Bay. So they did kind of go into what I was suggesting and it seemed to work. Um, I mean, let's not say it worked because offense wasn't great, but it 
Uh, definitely was it made sense for well, the opponent. The, I think they did have the big the big uh, Brees Hall touchdown. Right, they did get with one. get what they needed. So, um, so I think going into this Patriots game, not not to I know we'll focus on them more specifically. I, I think they should stick with that. You know, especially with Elijah Moore back. Uh, you know, the strength of your team is kind of moving away from the run game, a little closer to the passing game with Brees Hall, Brees Hall out now. Um, and the Patriots too, which we'll discuss later, are another team that aren't as good at stopping, uh, that isn't as good at stopping the run against 11 uh, as they are against 12. So I would stick with that. But, uh, but yeah, I think a good balance is crucial because that identity of two tight ends is, it's great to have that, to be able to enforce your will and just ground and pound, but you also don't want to rely on it too much because let's be honest, your offense is not as threatening when you have Tyler Conklin and CJ Uzama out there instead of, you know, uh, Elijah Moore and CJ Uzama's place or Garrett Wilson. Uh, so if you really want to un- unlock the explosiveness of the offense, you can't play too much of that. And I think they have good receiver talent. So you want to lean into that and play as much three receivers as, as you can. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, the defense just for a little bit uh, against Denver. And really, honestly, there's just one guy in particular I, I want to talk about. Um, there's there's plenty of, of guys who are maybe unheralded in, in the way that they're playing. And, and you know, Quan Alexander has been an unbelievable signing for the Jets. Quincy Williams looks a lot better. Um, obviously, the defensive line has had some great performances. I mean, there's this defense is, is playing lights out right now. And I, I said it the last few weeks, but it finally looks like the Robert Sala 49ers defense and they got to keep it up. I like how they're angry about the Pats game last year. I like uh, their matchup against this Pats offense. We'll talk about that in a second, but I think we almost are taking for granted what DJ Reed is doing. Cause I sauce Gardner is like the coolest player the jets have had in a long time. And, and you honestly can't take that for granted too. Cause how many times do you see a corner taking top four or top five and ball out like the way he's balling out. I mean, he just won AFC uh, rookie. We won a rookie of the week again, and he won AFC defensive player of the week uh, again. And, you know, he can't reach too much into those awards, but he's been unbelievable. And I love the confidence that Salah has in him to, you know, keep trying to keep trying to throw downfield on him. But DJ Reed doesn't really get nearly the amount of praise. Every, every once in a while, you'll see him pop up in a PFF graphic and Jets fans know how good DJ Reed is, but, Nobody in the broader national media is talking about DJ Reed. And Michael, again, I'll give you a, a bit of, uh, of credit. You know, when the Jets signed DJ Reed and we were talking, I think it was our post, you know, free agent, uh, free agency reactions, or whatever you said, how much you love this signing, how every single number number on this guy is elite. You watch the film and it backs up what the numbers say. And DJ Reed is playing opposite Sauce Gardner. So Sauce is getting all the attention as he should, but he's been unbelievable this year. How many free agent corners, and again, only a few weeks in, but I feel like you can say this, how many free agent corners, certainly none of the Jets have signed, come out and play like this off the bat? And so the fact that they have a free agent, a high-paid free agent corner, and then a top-drafted corner playing this well, not to mention Michael Carter the second, six-round rookie who's also playing unbelievable, if you want to talk about unheralded Jets, but I'll open that up to, to Michael Carter the second as well. Sauce Gardner, unbelievable coolest player that the jets have had in a long time i'm definitely getting his jersey very excited about him but dj reed and i guess we'll throw michael carter the second in there they've been lights out as well so what have you seen from them uh, this season and and why do you think they they don't get the you know the attention they deserve well i mean you got a guy like sauce gardner he's definitely gonna steal the the spotlight guy's name is sauce and he wears a cheese head yeah you're not gonna beat that it doesn't doesn't matter what you do you're not gonna overcome the spotlight of that guy but uh but yeah i mean DJ Reed deserves all the credit in the world because both of these guys being good is what make it allows both of them to complement each other and make one another look good. Because, you know, if, if the Jets had a bum and DJ Reed shoes, then Sauce Gardner wouldn't get to make the plays he makes because teams would be completing bombs on yeah. the other guy. And, yeah, people, and, you know, we'd give. Yeah, sorry. Right. No, this I mean. People always talk about Revis's 2009 season. You know what I remember from that season? I remember Lido Shepard getting burned over and over again on the other side and taking away from, from this jets pass defense. So to your point, it's amazing to have, or it's great to have one lockdown shut down corner, but it's amazing when you can have two of them or hell even three. Yeah, for sure. So like if the jets had a bad player over there, you know, sauce wouldn't get targeted, that, uh, targeted that often. I think we'd give him credit for that. But the fact that both of these guys are good is why, 
you know, they both get to make plays and why they continue to deflect all these touchdowns. And, you know, they both have a pick this year and they have these great coverage numbers. It's because teams can't really get an advantage. You, it doesn't matter which side of the field you put your best players on. They're still facing a great corner. Um, and speaking to that, the, you know, the lack of mismatches in this game, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I was afraid of was Cortland Sutton, a 6'4 receiver who's contested catch monster, had the fourth most contested catches going into this game. Him going up against DJ Reed, who's only 5'9", who, as great as he is, uh, Sutton has destroyed smaller cornerbacks this season. Um, and then in this game, lo and behold, it happens. You get a deep ball, Cortland Sutton one-on-one against DJ Reed, and, like, I was holding my breath. It's like, oh, this is what I didn't want. This is why I wanted to isolate sauce on him. And then what happens? DJ Reed with a picture perfect pass breakup. Uh, and then later he had another uh, two plays later. He had an open field stop on Sutton to bring up fourth down. So DJ Reed ri- rising to the occasion with a huge size mismatch, canceling that out. And it just goes to show that it doesn't matter what you do. Neither of these guys are. Uh, a player that can be exploited. That's not to say that, you know, never get beat, but it's not like there's something you could do between these two guys where, you know, all right, we could put a big receiver on Reed. That's a mismatch. Well, maybe it's not a mismatch or we could put a, a small, fast receiver on sauce. That's a mismatch. Well, we saw against Jamar chase and against the dolphins. Maybe that's not really a mismatch either. So they complement each other so well. And, you know, the, the play at the end of the game where sauce, uh, made that deflection against Sutton. Uh, the play itself was great, but Robbie Sabo had a, a great film breakdown of that play where he brought up a great point. But not only is it a great individual play, but it really shows the confidence that the coaches have in these guys. And, you know, the Jets are a pretty heavy zone coverage team. They don't shadow that much. Both of these guys stay on their side of the field, you know, read in the right, sauce in the left. But when it's crunch time and the Jets need a big play, the Jets are willing to gamble on these guys. And that's what they did as they should on that on that fourth and three play with Sutton is, you know, in that situation, what are your choices? You could play soft, give them a free first down and allow them to have four fresh set of four plays with a minute 30 on the clock to drive that ball and try to tie or win the game. You could do that to defend the end zone, give them that first down play it safe. Or you could say, Hey, here it is. We're going to play one high. We're going to man up on the outside and in the slot with Michael Carter the second. And we don't think you guys can beat us. We don't think your receivers can beat our corners. And what happens? They couldn't do it. So the fact that they were able, uh, that Ulbrick and Sala were uh, willing to make that call on fourth down where they said, go ahead, take a shot into the end zone on us. And we think we're going to beat you is such a, an amazing sign of confidence uh, in these corners and not just sauce because, you know, sauce ended up making the play, but they easily could have gone to read on the other side. But, uh, but just the fact that they put their corners in that situation and make a high risk, high reward play call like that, where, you know, they're willing to go all or nothing is such a sign of faith. Yeah. And, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it gives the jets more versatility on defense. Cause last year when you're watching them, it's just like, okay, how vanilla is this defense old brick? I mean, it just seemed like, all right, here's their cover three zone or here's the, you just, or they're now they're playing quarters and teams are able to just run right up the middle or there's wide open throwing lanes. And this defense obviously looks a lot different. They're a lot more confident. They have better players. Um, But having the, this good, a cornerback play in this defensive scheme. And, you know, I think a lot of people, including ourselves kind of bought into, okay, we don't need corners to, to uh, for this defense to work, you know, you saw what solid did in 2020 and that's true. You, this defense can survive if they have a great defensive line and they can survive if they have competent athletic corners. But if you add elite corners, like when the, the, you know, the 49ers brought in Richard Sherman, it changes this whole defense and it gives you that versatility to, like you said, offenses don't know what the jets are going to do. And they play fast. They hit ferociously shout out to DJ Reed again for that, that he, he had on Judy early in the game. Um, yeah, they play fast. They hit hard. They're versatile. Um, yeah, I just love the way this defense is playing, and I love this matchup uh, against New England. That's not to say that, you know, I think the Jets are going to smash the Patriots or anything like that. I just love that, uh, you know, you got a guy, Mac Jones, a quarterback, who's, you know, he's trying to kick people's calves out when he's when he's doing a quarterback slide. Like, try that on Quan Alexander. 
see, you know, see, try to try to run it up the middle when Quincy Williams is right there. Um, this defense hits so hard. They have attitude. They have confidence. They have swagger. They you know, they communicate well. It's just it's a sight to behold. And and let's just hope they keep it up because, you know, even if the offense is sputtering, the way the defense is playing, they can be in every game. And then it kind of gives you uh, to go back. The glass half empty is like, all right, this offense sucks. The glass half full, and you were texting me this this week as well. Is like, hey, but if this offense gets its shit together, the way this defense is playing, or if Zach Wilson gets his shit together in, in particular, there's no reason the Jets can't make that. And this is going to sound absurd. And you know what? I'll eat the YouTube comments yet again. If Zach Wilson can play to a to the level that we saw him play against Miami or that fourth quarter against Pittsburgh. And that's a huge if. But if he can do that, the way this defense is playing, there's no reason the Jets can't make a run because this defense is playing that well. You weren't getting this type of play from the Bengals defense. And yeah, you had elite quarterback play and Jamar Chase and whatever. I'm just saying every year a team like that comes out of nowhere. Clearly the Jets and Giants have, have been those teams this year. Um, the Jets are winning on the backs of their defense. So the glass half empty is this offense and Zach Wilson has not looked too good the last two weeks, especially but the glass half full is the way this defense is playing. If that offense gets its shit together, look out. That's all I'm saying. Um, so let's with that, Michael, actually, you know, before we get straight into the Pats game, there are a few pieces of news this week. We should probably address uh, injury wise. We don't know if Corey Davis will play or not. Uh, doesn't, yeah, it seems like honestly, it's too early to tell. We're recording this Thursday night. If he plays, that would be great. Zach certainly has a level of comfort with him. I also think that gives the Jets a little bit more flexibility with playing Elijah more in the slot, like we've been talking about. Whereas if Corey's out, they're probably going to play Elijah and Garrett outside with, with Barrios in the slot. But hey, you know, maybe they'll mix in some more Mims. Uh, I think they should get Jermaine Johnson back this week. I'm very curious to see which defensive line, um, d- which defensive lineman they, they, make an active who do you think it'll be or do you think they'll try to have everybody active because yeah curry's back interesting i don't know maybe does curry sit out i don't kind of seems like they have a role jermaine for him. Nah, you want to play jermaine's gotta play yeah, you want to play him i think Clemens is i will go with curry yeah uh, i guess i'll go with curry but we'll see what happens it's probably yeah probably curry maybe one of the defensive tackles but they and then they brought in limbo joseph for a visit was it this week or was it last week it was, it was this week. week. Yeah, it was this week. Um, those GNTs, man. Um, but Linville, if they bring him in, it's like, all right, well, who are you cutting there? Is that she, Babai Shepard, or are they just going to stockpile defensive linemen all season? I don't know. So that's that is something to to watch. I, Actually, I think you right. know what? You're excused. That was last week. <laughs> oh, okay. And that wasn't the GNTs. It was just Michael Nania. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that's it for the injuries. James Robinson, though, that was the big move. And you know, look, I I, I think that first of all. The one thing that that really signified to me is, okay, Douglas is all in on this year. Not me. I shouldn't say all in like they're you know, mortgaging the future, but just in the sense of it sent a message to the locker room that immediately that Monday they went and traded for James Robinson. And look, Michael Carter is still the starter. I am looking forward to seeing Carter get an increased workload, but you didn't want to have to be risking if he goes down that Ty Johnson's your starting running back. Robinson is a damn good running back. I know he's coming off the Achilles, but he's still been good this year. Um, his numbers are fantastic. I think he's a great scheme fit. He really gets north south uh, extraordinarily well. He's a tough physical runner. He, neither him or Carter maybe have that breakaway speed. So the Jets might not have the same amount of huge explosive touchdown plays. Um, but hell, you, you still saw like Michael Carter had a you know, huge game, a huge gain against Denver. And he had, you know, that huge gain against uh, uh, Tampa Bay last year. Or he's had a few of them. Uh, I think he had one against Miami. We're, Carter and same goes for Robinson can rip off those 30, 40, hell, even maybe 50 yard run. But a lot of times they do tend to get caught from behind. You know, I, I was watching um, what's it? it's not one jets drive. What, what's it? What's the, what was the thing they released in the summer? It's not one jets drive. It's like, uh, what was you know that I'm talking called? about flight flight 2022. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Well, LaFleur is talking about like Carter got one, one yard faster this year. Like he doesn't want to get caught from behind. So he'll have a chance to prove it. But what'd you think about the trade for James Robinson? Uh, what it, what it signals to the locker room uh, and then just him as, as a player. Yeah. I, I love it. Like you said, it's just, it's just a message to the locker room, to the locker room that you're not just going to stand pat with what you have, that you believe in the team enough of, of what they could do this year, that you're going to go out and your best player gets hurt. So you go trade for, a proven very good respected player to take his place because you want to be the best team you could be right now so i think it sends a good message um and then in terms of your game planning and your scheming i think getting a guy like this allows them to 
keep playing the way they want to play, you know, have two capable running backs, um, occasionally run some of those two back packages, which have worked so well for them. Um, Cause you know, with as much as, you know, if they didn't make this trade, Ty Johnson is your second running back. And in addition to him, you know, not being the greatest backup, it's like, you know, when it's, you can't really run those two back packages anymore because like you think of some of the things they do in those situations, you know, fake it one running back, throw it to the other. I don't want to throw passes to Ty Johnson with how many drops he's had. <laughs> not, yeah, not if that's and I, game I don't want him blocking either with how bad his pass blocking has been at times. Um, so it really takes away a lot, I think, um, that if they would if they didn't find another running back to replace Brees Hall. But you bring in James James Robinson, I think you have a capable enough guy to run your offense the same exact way without having to change anything. That's not to say, you know, Robinson's going to be as good as Brees Hall because I think you lose a lot of the home run hitting ability. Uh, his top speed is definitely not to Hall's caliber, but, uh, but he's still a very good player. And I think you're going to be able to, uh, I think that's, what's most important. You have two guys you could trust just like you did before. So you could continue running it the same way, but, um, but looking at Robinson specifically, I like his game. I think it's going to be a different kind of impact compared to Hall, but it's still going to be, a very good impact. I think the short yardage, he's really good at that. Uh, he's eight of eight scoring touchdowns from the one yard line for his career has never failed to score from that position. Um, wow. His yards after contact is great in his career. He was above the 80th percentile each of his first two seasons in yards after contact per carry this year. He's been down a little bit, but first three games, he is right on par, but then with, with the rest of his career, but Last three games, Jaguars cut his roll down. They're favoring Travis Etienne. Then his numbers went down. So, you know, maybe he does better when he's featured and that, you know, he wasn't, he does have a, a tendency to perform better in games where he plays more and gets more touches. So I think that's a plus because you could rely on him to handle the rock frequently throughout a game and still be efficient. Uh, so I like the after contact. I like the short yardage rushing. Um, I think his vision is great from watching some of his film, which I think will be good in this scheme. I think he'll capitalize on what's there. Uh, and then his pass blocking is really good, which I think makes him useful in passing situations. Uh, his drops aren't, aren't too low. He can make guys miss after the catch. Uh, he's not a great receiving running back, but I'd say he's capable. So, uh, yeah, I think he's a solid all-around player who brings toughness, downhill rushing, good vision, good pass blocking. So, uh I think, like I said, I think the impact will be different. The home runs are going to be down for sure, but I also think he'll do a good job of keeping the Jets ahead of the chains, you know, getting four to six yards on first down, three to five yards, second down, putting the Jets in those favorable second and medium and third and short situations, and then being able to convert those short yardage. I think those are two of the ways that he'll make a good impact in addition to the pass blocking. Joe Douglas, man. Yet another uh, team yeah. he's fleeced. Mighty Blake Cashman for James Robinson. That is absurd, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get out of myself, but it, the Jets have themselves a GM, man. I mean, that that's awesome. Uh, you know, look, I, we'll see if it pans out, but just the process and the value and the message it sent to the locker room, just everything that you wanted to see the Jets do this week. And it, and it really sets up a fascinating matchup with the Patriots this week. We'll get into it right now, Michael. Because I'll be honest, when, when Brees went down and when AVT went down, and look, the Jets, the good thing about, not the good thing about the injury, but the good thing, or the thing that you can think about and still be happy about is the Jets have those players. The Jets have those players for the foreseeable future. They have a guy who looks like he could be the next Adrian Peterson or the guy on Elijah Vera Tucker, who I don't even know to compare him to because I can't think of anybody who's playing you know, left guard, then right guard, then left tackle, then right tackle. Maybe he's our starting center next year. Who knows? Um, but the fact that the Jets have two of those guys, you know, it sucks. You really wish you had them for the rest of this year. But the Jets have, in Brees Hall's example, especially with the James Robinson trade, the Jets have other weapons. Their whole offense didn't come down. I mean, he is has been the, the heartbeat of their offense, and we'll see how they respond. But on paper, the whole thing was like, okay, if you want to take away Brees Hall, we got Elijah Moore. If you want to take away him, we got Garrett Wilson, or we could give the ball to Michael Carter, or the tight ends, or Corey Day, whatever. That was the whole idea, and now you're going to see it put to the test. AVT, in my opinion, is, and I honestly, I don't think this is just in my opinion, the bigger loss, and obviously it was the more shocking loss, but the Jets do get Fant and Mitchell back. 
probably, I mean, the, probably after the buy, we'll see. Fan is eligible to, to return. We might see him next week. We might see Mitchell next week. Who knows? I would probably bet on after the buy for both those guys, but who knows? The Jets have always been very weird about their injuries and when guys are coming back. And Michael, you were saying Saul is already getting a little weird about when fans coming back. So we'll see. We'll see how that plays out. But the Jets, in theory, should get some reinforcements at offensive tackle. And and I also think that Douglas has done a good job responding in season with the signings of Remmers we haven't seen yet. And a, a boy who, who didn't really shit his pants last week, Michael, from what you saw, right? Yeah, I thought it, I thought he's okay. He lost a couple times, but honestly, I thought there were other linemen who were worse than he was. Yeah, we'll see how he does against Matt Judon and a, a week for them to prepare against him. But at the very least, Michael, this game is fascinating. How do the Jets respond to all the adversity that they faced this last week? And adversity after a win, I, we should add. Um, I think for me, and like you said, it seems like we're saying this every week, but let's let's narrow the focus a little bit. This to me is the biggest game of Zach Wilson's career so far. And you could have said that about the Packers game. Cause all right, here's the jets are facing a really good team at Lambeau, the number one Fox game. Yeah. Okay. At the time that might've been true, but now you lose the heartbeat of your offense. You lose your personal protector. You haven't played well the last two weeks. The New York media is getting loud. You're still winning though. You get to play the team that really was the first time we ever, I mean, I thought Zach actually looked good in his, his debut against Carolina. Obviously he had some throws he'd like back, but it was that second game against the Patriots where you just saw him have honestly his own seeing ghost moment. Uh, and then he got hurt, hurt in the second game. So he didn't really even get a chance to, to rebound from it. And Bill Belichick has just made a living on young, timid quarterbacks. And what have we seen from Zach Wilson the last two weeks, a young, timid quarterback who's overthinking things. It's just, this is the team that has dominated this franchise for the better part of two decades for our generation of fans. And probably a little older than me too. I would say like, even my dad, like my dad was, you know, my dad's in his sixties and he hates the Patriots more than any other team. So I think generation aside, a lot of Jets fans look at the Patriots as their least favorite team. I, I know the dolphins a lot. There's a lot of bad blood there and, you know, if the Jets get really good, maybe the Bills will take that spot. But for me, Michael, there's something about the Patriots and Bill Belichick. And I know Brady's not there, but I've been to three different Jets-Pats games. This will be my fourth. So if, if they have a horrible game, I, I will never go to another Jets-Pats game. I've been to 2016 Jets-Pats, which actually was a good game. The Jets were up 10 in the fourth. They, they ended up crumbling. They couldn't. I think it was like James White scored and whatever. Then I went to the Scene Ghost game, and then I went to Zach's uh, home debut last year. Um, so I just, uh, the amount of times I've been at, the, at MetLife and it's like half Patriots fans and they're like taunting Jets fans. And I told that story a few weeks ago, we're, we're on the, the train back and I, I couldn't even talk because my voice was gone and I hadn't discovered the Batman voice yet. And, uh, and it's like all Patriots fans just blasting sweet Caroline and singing it. And it was just like, my blood was boiling. And so for me, Michael, this, this is the team that. I want to see the Jets beat. I mean, look, obviously every week you want to see the Jets win or whatever, but more than anybody else, Michael, I want to see the Jets beat the Patriots. That to me will be a real arrival statement. And look, the Jets have arrived in the sense that, look, they're five and two. And even if they lose this game, even if they lose the next two and they, they limp into their bye, limp, they're still what? Uh, five and four at their bye, five right. and four at their bye, which all of us would have signed up for. So even if they lose these next two games, they're still in a solid spot to regroup at the bye and figure some shit out against the Patriots the, the following week. But if they beat the Pats after all these injuries last week, and I don't care if the Pats aren't the same and they just lost the Bears, but if they do that this week, Michael, it will really, really send a message to, to, to who this team is. And then I guess next week you can make the same claim. If they can upset the Bills, it'll really send a message. But every week it kind of gets bigger and bigger. But focusing in on Zach Wilson specifically, you want that breakout game. I, he doesn't need to throw five touchdowns, but you just want to have him throw 250, 300 yards and, and, or at the very least do what he did against Miami, manage the game, play well, no turnovers, move the ball, get Elijah Moore involved, get Garrett Wilson involved, look like an NFL quarterback. Don't look like Bill Belichick has your number. And if he does that, Michael, my optimism for, for Zach Wilson as an NFL quarterback, even though he might take his, take his lumps against Buffalo or throughout the rest of the season, or even next year, will go up tremendously if he can he can beat this Patriots defense and look good while doing it this Sunday. So with that being said, Michael, let's hop into the Pats preview. And since we started with Zach, why don't we just open up there? You, you did talk a little bit about it and on what the coverage is 
uh, that the, the Jets have faced. And surprise, surprise, the Pats are, are not too much different. And you know they're going to key in on that stuff. Like the they're kind of in the middle of the you know the first two weeks we talked about okay the secondaries aren't really good for for pittsburgh or, or miami considering miami's were injured and pittsburgh they have minka but not much else and then the last two weeks great secondaries the pats you kind of would maybe put in the middle there but they have a good secondary and they have a secondary that knows how to take the ball away as solid said multiple times they've obviously new players but they've been coaching the system for so long they don't make many mistakes. They make sure to capitalize on your mistakes. They do a good job of confusing young quarterbacks. They do a good job of confusing offensive linemen with stunts and twists and linebackers and slot blitzes. And Pats are a, certainly a, a, a tough matchup, uh, no matter what their record is. So with that being said, Michael, what are you looking to see from Zach Wilson on Sunday? Oh, yeah. Like you said, I think this is this is absolutely a big game for him. And again, like we said earlier, that's not to say that when when a game is big, it doesn't unless it's a do or die, you know, make or break the playoffs game, or you're in the playoffs, or it's you know, you know winning in or whatever. Unless it's that, it obviously doesn't you know make or break anything. And like you said, you know they lose the next two, they're still in a good spot. But you know from Zach Wilson's perspective, I think this is a very big opportunity for him to get his season on the right track because and for so many reasons, like you said, you know prove that he could turn around what happened against the Patriots last year. Um, you know, the injuries now, I think there's going to be more pressure on him to provide more impact for the team, be a bigger reason that they win games with no Brees Hall, with no AVT. I think the passing volume is going to be up. The run game efficiency is going to go down a little bit. I think getting Robinson helps them maintain it, but really with no AVT, I think that's the bigger part. Uh, so there's more pressure on them. You're facing the Patriots, facing a, a coach who had your number last year and, and a team that had your number last year. You're starting your quasi second season, this being your 18th start. Um, I also think that's kind of overblown because I think the leap really comes with the real world time more so than the game time. Well, time, time having... off. Yeah, time off. Yeah. So I, I think uh, either way, though, it's still an, a, an important kind of point of his career. Um so, yeah, we'll see what, what he can do. I think it's big for a lot of reasons. It's an opportunity for him to uh, silence some of the doubters and really get a lot more people on his side. So um, looking at him specifically, I think it – like we talked about earlier, I think we want to see him attack early, make some big plays that can get his confidence going so he can get into that groove where he has the confidence and that switches on to where, you know, he's just – getting the ball out quickly, ripping it, taking shots into tight windows. Even if that means he throws one pick in this game earlier, you know, in the first half, if that's what it takes, or if that's a consequence of him playing aggressively, so be it. Because right now it almost seems counterproductive. Like I know he has no turnovers the last three games, but he really shouldn't have at least one or two. It feels like, um, and it's like, he's playing so safe that, you know, he's not, ripping the ball from the pocket he's kind of you know too hesitant to, yeah it's timid to challenge those tight windows so then he scrambles and then he ends up making a dangerous play anyway um whereas i'd rather just have him sit in the pocket and just shoot you know take shots so that's what i want to see him do i want to see him be poised in the pocket um attack tight windows especially down the sideline early in the game to back off that defense to show them that you will take shots down that sideline um, and, and it helps your teammates too, because you know, when teams are playing cover one against you and they're playing man on the outside, the Jets are struggling a little bit with beating that this year. They've had some games where they're not really separating. So if your quarterback's not going to help them out by showing the defense, okay, I'm going to challenge that and punish you for doing that, then they're going to keep manning up and they're not going to separate and then things snowball. So you want to be able to create positive, uh, a positive impact for your offense by challenging challenging them deep make them take that safety out of the box help out your run game by doing that um and then help out your receivers by drawing more zone coverages soft softening it up um you got to be threatening to get the defense to do that and until zach wilson is threatening to the defense they're just going to keep playing aggressive and it's going to really kind of put a uh, a limit on what this passing game could be so i want to see fourth quarter pittsburgh zach you know, yeah. just playing loose, nothing to lose, drop back in the pocket and throw the ball confidently. I want to see him step up in the pocket more. Um, sometimes it is good to escape. Like we said, there, there are a lot of good in, 
uh, instances where it's good to do that. But sometimes I want to see him step up. It's not something he does a lot, but there are times where if he just steps up into his throw and buys more time to scan the field from the pocket where you're not cutting the field in half because you're scrambling to one side, you can still read the whole field. I want, I want to see him stay in that pocket and make plays from in there. So, uh, so those are some of the things we're looking at for him. Um, and another thing is the Patriots lead the league in man coverage percentage this season, well over 70%, which is very high. Uh, so that does open up some opportunities for you to tuck the ball and run sometimes. So uh, that's right. another thing. I like, exactly. I, I, ab- yeah, I absolutely like that. He prioritizes passing when he scrambles. I think in general, you want to do that, but sometimes I think it's good to show the, the defense that you're a running threat too, because that will force the defenders of coverage to uh, think about coming up and defending you. And then that could open up throws. So uh, I think that's a common theme throughout everything I just said is creating new threats, you know, whether that's attacking down the sideline, being aggressive, stepping up in the pocket and showing that you can make plays from in there. And then sometimes uh, tucking the ball and running when you scramble instead of always just going laterally. I think there are ways he could play more confidently and it will unlock different aspects of a skill set. And it will also show different things to the defense that can open things up for the rest of the offense and draw different looks for, for the jets that could be more favorable for them. And I think, you know, look, he will probably be a little jittery behind a boy. He, you know, that that bill is going to send the heat and you love, if you're the Patriots, you love that matchup of Judon on on a boy. He, Um, so yeah, like you don't want to see Zach escaping the pocket immediately. You'll probably see a lot of what he's done this year where it's like, all right, if what I see, isn't their run, but like, yeah, I want to see him use his legs more. He's we're seeing it behind the line of scrimmage. Let's see it out in open field. So I think that's on the floor to give him more of those opportunities. And while you're talking, I was just thinking about something and let me know what you think about this. I think that yes, Zach is, is leaving the pocket too quickly and he's cutting the field in half and, and that has led to some not so great results. Right. But he's doing it because he's he's uncomfortable in the pocket right now because of whether he hasn't just grown, matured enough as a quarterback. We've seen him do it, but the last few games he hasn't been comfortable. I think it's mostly due to lack of trust in his offensive line and that that inner clock in his head saying, okay, if it's not there, I got to get off of it. So he's escaping the pocket really quickly. So if I'm a floor, I'm giving Zach tons of plays where he's designed boots, designed plays for him to be on the move and to be out of the pocket because clearly that's how he feels comfortable right now. And he's shown the ability to make guys miss. So draw up plays for him to be on the move and not just, okay, this is a a pass where you're supposed to be in the pocket. No, I'm not comfortable. And he, you know, rolls out the back of it. And then it's a a scramble drill improv. Hey, everybody run to the right where I'm at or run downfield. And I got to huck it down. Then we're playing backyard football. It's like, all right, Zach, if you're not comfortable behind your offensive line or hell, if your offensive line isn't holding up, work that PA boot game work work just getting him in motion and, and running and i think that will help get him comfortable um and it'll give him more of those opportunities to take off and even if he just gets four yards there's plenty of opportunities like you said where it's like all right he rolls out and he has space and he could run but he's trying to throw and that's great and all but it's like you'll take a four yard run every play you'll score a touchdown so just if you have the space and it's there take it for, for most times if there's a guy who might break free down the field on single coverage or something then maybe stand in the pocket but i agree he's got to use his legs more and i think for lafleur Part of what could get him comfortable, put him on design moves a lot more. Give him some read options. Let him use his athleticism. Let him feel like a football player, and you might see him actually perform like one. Um, Elijah Moore, we talked about him a little bit. How amazing would it be if he could just have a big game, a big breakout game? I think the fans would forgive him. (laughs) The team would forgive him. Yeah, you'd have to deal with a little bit of the on him stuff and you post, you know, cryptic Bible phrases or whatever, but if he can have a big game, Michael, that will do a lot to, uh, to I think, calm some of the uh, Elijah Moore uh, tension or slander. I mean, look, if you see the him, if he's dapping up the floor practice and he's goofing around with teammates and everybody's acting like everything's all, all good. And hey, let me say anything. I said that would happen on Thursday's pod and I got made fun of. And, and honestly, it does sound ridiculous. And you have to wonder if behind the scenes there's still some tension because let's be honest, there probably is. There were plenty of tweets this pa- these past few days about like, you know, no eye and team and all that stuff. So the player certainly had something to say about it. There's been no clear indication that he's really come out and apologized to the team or has really walked it back or, or whatever, but he's here now. They're pretending like the vibes are good or the vibes are good, but he's playing on Sunday. 
what are you expecting from him? I mean, how, how can LaFleur and, and Wilson get him going? Because we know that he's, ta- it's not like this is a, a case of, or a guy like Zach Wilson, where it's like, all right, we've seen little flashes, but we don't know if he's the guy. Like, we are pretty confident to say Elijah Moore, if we traded him, would be, end up being a good receiver elsewhere. He just hasn't gotten, you know, he might not be a, a, an X receiver, an outside receiver, but if you put him in the slot, he's a, he's a good receiver. We've seen enough, and he's dominated enough training camp practices to, to feel that way. What does the floor need to do to get him involved? Uh, and how do you see Sunday playing out with uh, with Elijah Moore's return? Yeah, I, I think like we said earlier, it would it would be good to see them kind of move towards a little bit more of that balance where Elijah Moore's getting more slot reps because I, I think that emphasizes what he does best because you know in terms of him getting open the season and getting quality targets, you know they're tr- still struggling to find that rhythm. But what I think you could definitely trust him to do is make plays once he does have the ball. So finding easier ways to get him the ball is, I think, definitely the goal. And I think when he's in the slot, it's the easiest way to do it. You get him off the line of scrimmage. He doesn't have to go through press coverage. Um, and, and, you know, this is, again, to talk about this being a man coverage team, like I just talked about, Zach should run more. And that's one of the things that you, know, you can get with man coverage because the defense is turning their back to you. Um, another thing that you can do against man coverage is run some picks you know some rub routes and i think that's a way you could free up elijah more underneath uh so you can get him the ball on you know in breaking routes where he's catching the ball with a head of steam and then he could use that speed after the catch so uh i know he's a lot of route running skill and it's tantalizing and and i said going into the season i wanted him to play outside and they tried tapping into it just hasn't really clicked and again that's not to say that he could He's never going to play out there. You could still give him some reps there sometimes, but for the most part, this is a guy who just you need to get the ball in his hands. And right. I want to see him in the slot again against this Patriots team. I want to see some rubs designed to get him the ball. Um, some screen plays, you know, they called five of them last week. They even threw Mims a screen. Let's get more of a screen early in the game. See what he can do with it. Um, jet motion, jet sweeps, things like that. Get this guy the ball right now and then take it from there. Because yeah, you know, it's you know it's, it's not like you want him to be, you know, uh, you know, just a player who you're just feeding the ball to because he has, like I said, he's route running potential and you want to tap into that. But right now, like things haven't been clicking, so let's just work it back, get him the football, allow him to make plays, and then kind of expand it from there and try to find a role that works, especially as this offense changes with the injuries, um, the tough opponents coming up, with Zach Wilson hopefully developing more things are going to change a little bit. So let's kind of adapt, start by getting him the ball, allowing him to gain some confidence, establish himself as a threat again, that the defense has to respect and then work it from there. And we'll see what route combinations kind of work best for him. But to start out, I really just want them to emphasize finding ways to get him the football. I, I two things that you said there that, that I, cause like, first you don't want to reward, uh, his behavior i guess right but at the same time look like Brees is out elijah here's your time to shine i mean you know you threw a whole tantrum about not getting the ball but here you go and as much as you don't reward it you got an angry elijah Moore ready to prove something right so elijah here's your chance give him the ball keep giving him the ball give him a chance to to show what he was talking about because again here comes some glass half full takes but i guess you know some people probably just come to that pod come to this pod for that Okay, what Elijah Moore did was childish. What Elijah Moore did was dumb. It really sucks. Um, you wonder how that affects his long-term plans with the team in terms of how uh, Joe Douglas and Robert Saul see him. But the one thing, the one positive maybe you can take out of it, this might be a reach, you tell me, is the fact that he was he, that he's this confident in his abilities to request a trade <laughs> six games into his second year gives me some confidence in him as well. It's like, all right, well, if you think you're that good, that you really haven't done anything, but you think you're this good that you deserve the ball. And the fact that you're not getting the ball, but the team is winning is such a farce that you don't even want to be here because you you're Michael Jordan, you're Kobe Bryant. You grew up watching these guys. There can't be more than one alpha on the team. He, if he thinks he's that level of player and he requests the trade, go out and prove it. So that's the, the one thing you could take is like, all right, well, maybe he's that guy then. And he'll have a chance on Sunday. I mean, look, New England has a great secondary and they play Buffalo the next week. But I think after the bye, he'll have a, a few more opportunities. So it's not like, you know, as much as we want to hype up every single game, and this is certainly a big one, 
if things don't go well on Sunday, it's still like, all right, you're still five and three entering a home game against Buffalo. And then you got your buy to regroup, you know, depending on where you're sitting at. And then the other thing with, with more is I think the thing that we forget is that his big stretch last season wasn't with Zach Wilson. It was with Mike white. It was with Joe Flacco and it was with Josh Johnson. And so him and Zach, like he had him and Zach had some nice plays, you know, the Philly game, they had a few nice plays. They get a few completions to him, you know, against uh, Houston. And like, he's he, you know, obviously he's thrown the ball to Elijah Moore before, but that chemistry with Zach, I think if you get him inside and you feed him touches and you get Zach used to throwing the ball to number eight, if you want to put him outside, it makes it more likely for that to be successful. Because I think, look, you have a timid quarterback who doesn't want to make the big mistake. Yeah, it's, Elijah is not a, you know, he, he can separate, but he's not a huge separator on the outside and he's a small target. So it's like if, if Zach doesn't have that chemistry, he doesn't feel as confident to try to test him on the outside then he's not going to. So put him inside, like you said, feed him touches, try to build that chemistry between him and Zach. And then look, if you want to put him back on the outside, I don't recommend it. You might have better success with that, but I think you got to get him. You got to get him going. He's too good for him to be a complete non-factor. And so I know Robbie came on and talked about, you know, the slot receiver is the point guard. They got to set other things up for other receivers. I don't think that we've seen enough from Elijah Moore to say that he can't do that outside of him requesting a trade, but on the field, you know, I think that first of all, he hasn't really had the opportunity to play that much slot here. Cause if you go back to last year, Jamison Crowder, Braxton Berrios, Ellie even Keelan Cole was getting some slot reps. So he had a few, but he didn't play that much slot last year. And then this year he hasn't really played it at all either. He's had some reps obviously, but we haven't seen the jets deploy Elijah Moore as a full on slot receiver yet. And I think if you do that, you'll get him going. And then if you want to open up the bag later in the season and give him more reps outside, okay, fine. But start with, you know, uh, crawl before you can walk and walk before you can run, you know? And I think that's what the Jets have to do with Elijah Moore. Um, I think that this pa- Patriots secondary and their corners in general um, aren't maybe as intimidating as the last two weeks, but they're still a damn good secondary and they're secondary that knows how to take the ball away. So for me, Michael, as much as we talked about feed Elijah Moore the ball, feed Elijah Moore the ball, and they have to do that. I think that this game is going to be a lot of the running backs and the tight ends. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Because this is, I think the way you beat this Patriots defense right now is is the run game. They're not stopping the run very well. They're 26 right now in yards per carry allowed, almost five yards per carry, just under that. Um, so they're giving up rushing yards this week. And anyone who watched them play the Bears last week, uh, and, and granted, it's a different run game because, you know, they have the quarterback threat. But even before that, 199 to the Packers, 188 to the Ravens. Um, and then 243 to the Bears last week. They've been giving up some rushing yards. Um, so I think the Jets have an opportunity, even without their two big pieces that they just lost, uh, to run the ball in this game. So I think it's going to start there. And then throwing the ball to running backs, too, uh, will be big. The Patriots have given up the most yards per target in the passing game to running backs this season. So that's been a weakness. They haven't uh, covered running backs very well, They're giving up 7.8 yards of pass to running backs, which – for a running back is very high. Most running backs are well below that. So uh, targeting the running backs, I think, could be an opportunity to make plays in this one, especially if the, you know, the Pats blitz heavy. Maybe you catch them with a screenplay on one of those with the running back leaking out. I think that's something that could do some damage. Um, but the run game is where it's all going to start. And their best run stuffer is Christian Barmore, their young defensive tackle. But he, his status in this game is up in the air. So if they don't have him, and their defense, and he's stopping the run great, and their run defense is already struggling. They don't have him. It, it's going to be a really favorable matchup for the Jets' run game. Yeah, Again, even in spite of the losses. So uh, I'm going to start with that run game. But I go back to Zach Wilson and thinking about how he can complement that, you know, using his legs, you know, when he, when he sees man coverage, being able to run. And then, like you said, attacking outside to – force the Patriots to back off a little bit and respect that so it can open up lanes in the run game uh, and they don't the Patriots don't get the chance to stack the box and really allocate resources to that run game so I think Zach Wilson being aggressive will really help the Jets be able to uh, maximize their advantage in the run game Uh, and then looking at the personnel at some of the splits there the Patriots like the Broncos last week stopped the run much worse against 11 personnel they're uh, fourth worst with 5.9 yards per carry allowed against 11 personnel. So I think that that should be the game plan again this week. Get your three receiver sets out there. 
spread it out, take some shots early, force the pass to take guys out of the box. And you should be able to make plays in the run game and you should have some opportunities outside to make plays. Zach's just had, got to have the confidence to attempt those throws for better or worse. So, um, so yeah, I think it, the running backs are going to be big. Target them in the past game. Um, then on the ground, got to break some tackles, find those holes uh, because they will, those opportunities will be there to get yards against this defense. And the other thing to, to keep in mind, I, obviously Brees losing Brees is, is a you know, body ball blow to this team. I mean, it really sucks, but they have a guy, Michael Carter, who you can still be really excited to watch on Sundays. It's not all of a sudden it's like, all right, well, and here's Tevin Coleman. Now it's like Michael Carter before the draft, Michael, we were all excited about him being RB one. All right. Maybe they'll take a running back on day three or whatever. He's still a guy. And obviously James Robinson is, I'm curious to see him as well, but Carter's still a guy that it does seem like when he's on the field, he makes plays and Brees really emerged the last few weeks. So we've gotten a little bit less of Carter, but he still has made, you know, long play. He had that long play against green Bay at the end of the game. He had a big, a few big plays against Denver. Uh, he's still a damn fun running back to watch. And as a guy who makes a lot of guys miss and who can help out in the passing game. So the Brees injury really hurts, yes, but they have a guy in Carter to to be able to run the football well with, it, you know, in conjunction with with James Robinson or if they activate Bam or Ty Johnson or whatever. You'll learn a lot on this first drive for this game, though. It's like if the Jets can run the ball, then I'll feel very confident in their ability to win this game. If they if if they open up first and ten, hand off Carter eight yards, you'll feel pretty good. If he's getting stuffed and then it turns to Zach Wilson. Well, then here we go, baby. Like, then we got to see Zach Wilson rise up. But if they can get the run game going, you have to be really good about where this Jets offense will be against this Patriots defense. But, like, make no bones about it. It's a tough match. It's another tough matchup for this offense. It's another tough matchup for Zach Wilson, for these receivers. He may have another dud at home. It would suck. But who? if they keep winning, who cares? Like, it's a lot easier to develop when you're winning. And it's like, if they can go into that Buffalo game at 6-2, and two, which – even I, as one of the more optimistic Jets fans, never predicted that. Um, you have to to really like where they're at. Even if Zach is still, you know, you you want to see him improve off the last two weeks. But even if he doesn't light up the scoreboard, like if he if he can have the type of game he had against Miami, which by the way he would have had two touchdowns if Brees doesn't get tackled the one on, on those two of those plays. But um, if he has that type of game, Michael, I mean, you have to be over the moon with, with how he played. So. Very, very curious to watch this Jets offense against this Patriots defense. But, Michael, this Jets defense versus this Patriots offense, I I can't tell what I'm more excited to see because the Jets offense, it feels like they have a lot to prove. That's kind of where the – not the – I mean, this game would feel big regardless, but maybe what's the – What's at stake for this for this game is like, can this Jets offense respond with no Elijah Vera Tucker and no Brees Hall and Elijah Moore's return and can Zach Wilson step it up? That's where like kind of all the storylines are. But this Jets defense is playing out of their mind. They hit hard. They they play fast. They communicate. They take the ball away. They create big plays and sacks. And then you're playing this team that blew them out last year, was showboating on them and running up the score. And they've got an asshole quarterback who's trying to injure other defenders when he's giving himself up on the play and the team that's dominated this franchise for two decades, your defense is really your punch is your attitude is, is your a way to set the tone and to show these, you know, uh, this team that you're different. Not only are you wearing different uniforms, but you're a different team. This is a different era of jets football and it's a different era of Pats football. So the defense can set the tone uh, early. And of course we'll see uh, what the ratio of jets to Pats fans is, but I think this is going to be a really, really loud MetLife game. It's supposedly going to be a really nice day. Um, so I'm, cannot wait for sunday but for this defense michael they're going to come out there fans are going to be loud try to match that 2009 week two jets pats energy we'll see if they can replicate that in metlife how do you see them attacking this patriots offense which let's be honest has not been very good this year yeah it'll be interesting interesting to see what they do because mac jones has played a much different style of football this year uh he's thrown the highest percentage of his passes over 20 yards in the entire league at about 20 percent so that's one out of every five passes he throws is a deep shot so he's been attacking downfield this year he's got the second highest average depth of target only Jameis Winston is ahead of him and we know Jameis Winston's a gunslinger so to be in that company tells you the type of football he's playing this year and he's not the dink and dunk Mac Jones from last year and it hasn't worked well the results definitely haven't been good he's got six picks and two touchdowns he's turning the ball over a lot uh, so he's fumbled the ball a few times 
He's, he's got a fumble this year. It's a fumbles last year. So uh, he's not as effective as he was last year. Uh, teams are playing a lot of man coverage against the Patriots. And they're kind of playing them similarly to how they're playing Zach, but he's responding differently. Um, he's getting a lot of man coverage uh, in single high too, and he is attacking it, but the results haven't been good. A lot of turnovers and ultimately the scoring just hasn't been as great for the Patriots as you're used to seeing it. So, uh, so it'll be interesting. And then his intermediate passing numbers are what stood out to me when I was looking at uh, some of his data. He's He's been very bad on intermediate passes, 10 to 19 yards downfield, no touchdowns, four picks, adjusted completion percentage, only 45%. That's the worst in the league. So it makes me think the way the Jets play defense, you know, the Jets are a heavy cover four team, uh, too high corners dropping back on the outside quarters coverage. They play the most of that in the league. And I think that plays into stopping Mac Jones because it takes away the deep pass. It encourages intermediate throws, which is where he struggled. Um, so I think it kind of plays into that plays into his tendencies. Uh, but at the same time, I could see them, you know, maybe playing a little more single high this game. Um, Cause the jets have done a little bit of both this year. They've kind of adapted based on the opponent, but um, I could see them maybe doing more single high, get Whitehead in the box to try and stop the run because the Patriots do run the football pretty well. Ramondre um, Stevenson has been very good this season. He's averaging five yards carry. He's got four touchdowns. And Damian Harris is pretty good as well. So they have a good duo there. I think that's how the Patriots want to win games is rushing with those guys. So do the Jets maybe instead try to be a little more aggressive commit to stopping the run and challenge yes. Mac Jones to throw those deep throws. Yes. Or do you, or do they or do they stick with, you know, their, no. their base defense, which is what they did against the Broncos last week, which is drop back, play safe. We could stop the run without an extra guy. Um and you're not going to beat us deep. That's what they did against the Broncos last week. It worked pretty well. But uh against this Patriots team, you know, I think there's a also an opportunity to switch it up and commit to stopping the run. Uh, and challenge Mac Jones to beat you deep. And, and I know you're saying you agree with me, but um, here's here's why I think I agree with you. And it's because Broncos last week, the difference is their run game is not that good. And the Jets could feel confident that they did not need an extra guy to stop the run in that game. Well, so they just played safe and they were able to stop the run without stacking the box and it worked out. Uh, but against Patriots, Patriots can run the ball on you. So I think it could be useful to have that extra guy in there just play single high and challenge Mac Jones to beat you deep because he hasn't really done it incredibly effectively this year. And he's been uh, quite turnover prone. So, uh, so yeah, what do you think? Well, okay. That's the thing with these young quarterbacks is you really never know who you're going to get because at the same time, there's a Pat's podcast somewhere who's breaking down Zach Wilson's intermediate numbers and deep numbers. And it's like, you never really know what you're going to get with these guys. They're still developing. And in the Patriots case, you, you don't even know which quarterback you're going to get because you might even see Bailey Zapp. And so if if Bill Belichick is looking at this Jets defense and the way that they've played and they say, okay, Mac, you need to go back to what you were doing last season and what Bailey Zapp has had some success with, which is take what the defense has given you, hit the underneath stuff, be dink and dunk Mac Jones, and we can win football games. And so I guarantee you that's what they're going to do. I don't think Mac is going to – I think if the Jets do play that cover four and play back – I don't think he's going to be trying deep shots. I think he's going to be trying to take the dink and dunks. And like, yeah, the Jets defense oh, it worked out last week, but there were still a few moments in that game, Michael. I mean, they shored things up in the second half, but there was that one drive in the first half where Jets defense just looked like they had no teeth. I mean, they got helped. I know the Broncos got help with a penalty and whatever, but um, they were they were able to run the ball. They were able to complete those, those completions. And maybe with a better quarterback, Michael, the Jets might not have won that game. You know what they did against Aaron Rodgers is they stacked the box. They played man-to-man coverage. They trusted their corners. And they made life hell for one of the best quarterbacks of all time. And so I think that's exactly what the Jets do. These pass receivers don't scare anybody. And I, I think you just man them up. You bring Whitehead down into the box. Maybe you go, uh, you know, you, you can bring in uh, your your base defense with uh, with Quan, Quincy, and CJ. Yeah, defend the run, defend the underneath stuff, and say, hey, Mac, if you want to try that single coverage to Devontae Parker or Tyquan Thornton, be my guest because they the Jets are uh, the quarterback duo for the Jets right now is top three, maybe top two. You could make an argument top one, but the Eagles with Bradbury and Slayer, you know, looking pretty good as well. But this these Jets corners are elite and they have to lean on them. So no, they right. shouldn't play. They shouldn't play much cover four against uh, Mac. They should because uh, even if they hit one deep shot, 
I'm confident that we've seen enough this season to know that throughout the game, the Jets are going to win those matchups. So yeah, stack the box, stop the run, man them up, and yeah, bait Mac into trying Sauce Gardner deep. Bait him into trying DJ Reed deep. These safeties, hell, are even playing pretty well and, and taking the ball away. So I think they go more to what they did against Green Bay. And, and, and that, to me, is exciting, too, because there's also something about that attitude and the way that you play when you're saying, all right, we're going to man them up, we're going to bring everybody into the box, and we're going to get after you, that I think that'll bring the right mentality that the Jets defense needs to play with on Sunday. they got to take this game away from the Patriots. they got to give them that payback. And I think, uh, I, I don't know, I think that's, that man coverage and leaning on the, the cornerback play is definitely the way to do it. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think that's the way to go. And and, and we'll see both. It's never, never yeah, cut no, and dry. Exactly, you, exactly. you always do both. But, um, but, uh, but I think leaning into that is, is the way to go. Um, because, you know, I think the run game is what scares you the most about the Patriots. That's what you want to ensure you stop. Denver was a little bit different because I think you felt like you could stop the run without, you know, over committing to it, which early in that game, it didn't work. You know, they had that great drive early on, but the Jets, stuck with it and it ended up working for the rest of the game but the patriots they will run the ball down your throat they will dink and dunk down your throat if you don't get up to the line of scrimmage and stop them so i think you really do want to live with those mac jones deep bombs invite him to throw those and just trust that sauce gardner and dj reed and mc squared are going to be able to beat jacoby myers and taekwon thor and, and uh Nelson Aguilar, whoever they have. Devontae Parker. Great yeah, research I, to say that. Yeah. No. <laughs> hey, we actually no, we I did, know who we they have. Research. Come on. Devontae now. Parker, Jacoby Myers, Nelson Aguilar, Tyquan Thorne. There you go. Is a Hunter Henry much of a threat in this game, do you think? Do you think they try to attack the tight end position? I mean, the Jets have seemingly done a pretty good job against tight ends this year, but I don't really know if they've faced anybody outside of Andrews week one that was really that threatening, unless I'm really botching somebody off the top of my head. I mean, I guess Kaseki they played, they played Njoku, Friermuth, but it seemed like they did a good job against the tight ends. Do you think Henry is, you know, we've talked about the Jets offensive game plan to be like, all right, we'll throw the ball to the running backs and the tight ends, obviously, in addition to feed Elijah Moore. But um, do you think the Pats try to lean on that? If the Jets try to stack the box, say, all right, let's get our passing game going. It feels like every time the Jets play the pass, the Pats, they have a screen pass. To a running back, or they yeah, have a dump off, or a wheel out. Ends. The, the, the running good. backs, exactly. So, and last year they did the same thing. So, how much do you think that'll play into, you know, if the Jets do go at that man coverage, play the box? Look, yes, they want to go punch the Patriots right in the mouth, but you also have to be disciplined because you know those screen plays are coming, you know those draw plays are coming. You know, you they're well coached, and they're going to attack what the Jets' weaknesses are, and it can be some overcommitments um, with this attack style front. Um, so how do you see the Jets kind of managing covering the running backs and the tight ends in the passing game? Well, I'm looking at uh, Henry's numbers right here, and it's interesting because when Jones was playing the first three games, Henry did pretty much nothing. Three catches yeah. for 28 yards in three games. But then Jones goes out, Bailey Zappi comes in. Then he starts to get more involved. He's 10 catches the next three games for over 120 yards. So I think that shows the disparity between these two guys right now. Mac Jones is... He's not the Mac Jones he was last year, at least in the games he's played. But again, so far. but again, 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 you, we don't know which version of these quarterbacks we're getting. Right, exactly. That, that's, Same what, as that. that's what I was going to say. Like, it, so far, that's what he's been. So we don't, we don't know. But at least at this point, Mac Jones has just been airing it out like no one else. So it, I'm very interested to see if they continue to play that way, or and if the Jets try to bait them into it, or if the Pats try to get back to what they do best, what Mac Jones did best last year, which is just manage the game and methodically work down the field. Um, if I'm the Jets, I do everything I can to take that away and invite him to continue playing the way that he's been playing. I think the other thing too, um, when you look at this Jets defense, and this has kind of been my my way to, to see, okay, do I think the Jets will win this game? Going back to last year, it's really comes down to this. On defense, is the Jets defensive line better than their offensive line? Because if that's the case, and look, maybe on paper it might not be, then it's like, all right, well, the Jets have to play that way. Or maybe on paper the Jets defensive line should be way better than the uh, opposing offensive line, like we thought that going into the Bengals game, and they didn't play that way. So you can never tell on paper, but if the Jets are going to win games most of the times on defense, 
their defensive line has to be wreaking havoc. They have to be get winning with those four man rushes. They have to be better than the, the opponent's offensive line. How do you see that matchup? This Jets defensive line versus the Pats offensive line. It's not the Pats O line of, of old, but it's still a damn good O line. You know, you know, they're going to give them a fight, but against Green Bay, you would have thought, okay, this Packers offensive line is pretty good. And the Jets won that matchup, dominated that matchup it was their best defensive line performance of the year. So it's tough to predict, but on the outset, how do you feel the Jets match up with the Patriots? in the trenches yeah, overall it's not a terrible offensive line um you know the run game has been good like i said and then looking at their pass blocking efficiency ranking they are 13th right now so not a terrible offensive line but what's what's encouraging is what you just said the packers offensive line is pretty solid too and so is the broncos and the jets were up to the challenge in both of those games uh well, packers are uh six in pass blocking efficiency broncos are 12th so, I mean, I, I mean, did you have something to say about that? Well, no, no, I was just going to say the Bron- I think the Packers game, they definitely came to play. Yeah. The Broncos game, they, they, they woke up for sure, and they made plays when they needed to, but they didn't necessarily yeah. control that yeah, game the way you would have liked. Yeah, there, there were definitely some dry spells for the pass rush. That was much more about coverage than pass – coverage and run defense than pass rush. But overall, I think in the end, it was a solid yes. pass rush game um, yes. with some assistance from the coverage. Packers was dominant, though. But either way, I think – uh, both those offensive lines are not not they're good offensive lines. They're the I mean, how many offensive lines do people look at and actually think they're good? I feel like people are overcritical of offensive lines in the NFL. These two in most categories are top half, and the Jets against both of them. Uh, both of them were up to the task. So Patriots are another one. Let's see if they can do it again this time at home with the benefit of crowd noise. So uh, yeah, I like I do like the matchup. Um, their weakness is at the tackle spots. Uh, Trent Brown and Isaiah Wynn have been very mistake prone this year. They've combined to give up seven sacks and they already have 15 penalties combined. So they're very exploitable. The interior trio is good. Um, Cole Strange has been solid. The rookie, uh, David Andrews, he's a mainstay for them. Uh, but his status is up in the air. If he doesn't play, that will be big. Uh, then they have Michael Onwenu at guard as well. So that interior trio is good, but the tackles. That's where they could do damage. Uh, but where it gets interesting is, you know, talking about Mac Jones's deep ball again. If you get that edge pressure, he's been willing to step up and take shots. So you need to complement that with interior pressure to turn those into sacks, to take away those deep throws. Uh, if the Jets can get both working, and which you think they will with the way Quinn Williams is playing. That's what's so great about having him alongside these edge rushers is that he's consistent. He's winning every week, creating cave so when the edge pressure is there, they're going into the interior rushers. Uh, if the Jets can get both working, they should be able to take away that deep game and uh, really force Jones into what he doesn't uh, what he doesn't want to do right now and get some sacks and create some pressure and make him uncomfortable. Yeah, and and I guess to close on the defense here, it's the point that I made last week. And with this defense and this mindset in particular that they play with, it every game. And every time that they they win or they play well, that confidence grows and it radiates and it feels like it makes them play better. They can buy into what Robert Sala is saying. It's hard for Sala to be the type of coach he is when they're losing. Um, you know, he's he's done it and he held hot and strong and he certainly has shown the ability to handle adversity. But when they're winning, especially on the defensive side of the ball, and these guys are believing that all gas, no break mentality and, and the positions that the, this coaching staff is putting them in. Uh, and they just they just start to ball out. It feels like it just starts to radiate. You kind of get that that snowball effect. Um, and I just feel like last week, like, yeah, okay, they didn't face an elite quarterback or anything or an elite offense for that matter. But just the fact that they were able to handle all the adversity that the, the Jets offense, frankly, dealt them that game or even the fact that they had that that long touchdown drive that they they allowed in the first half and they they didn't break, they didn't fold you know, they kept giving the Jets offense opportunities to win the game. And then they just went and won it themselves. And then even after the classic Jets moment, CJ Mosley gets the game winning interception, clearly still should have been an interception gets overturned somehow. Okay. Well, there you go. There's the same old Jets moment. Here comes the, the Rhett rip into Cortland Sutton touchdown. And now we go to overtime and the Jets lose or whatever. Again, it doesn't matter. The Jets make the stop on fourth down. So I think that that confidence that they will have gotten from 
obviously the, the comments they got from the, the Miami game comments they got from the Green Bay game gave them a, a lot heading into Denver but the confidence that they must have taken from Denver to go on the road and face all the adversity they did and to keep coming up big I know it wasn't the best offense ever that will show up on MetLife in my opinion I think you just keep seeing that that snowball effect and look it doesn't mean that they're going to ball out every week but you know the fact that they're putting up these performances is valuable even though Sunday was ugly against the Broncos and it was not necessarily a fun game to watch. You didn't leave it necessarily feeling good about the state of this team. That was a huge win for this defense, in my opinion. And so I, I'm really excited to see what they come out against a team that ran up the score on them with all the confidence they have right now. They're firing on all cylinders and they want to go hit somebody, you know, as Ron Middleton says, if it moves, hit them. If it don't move, hit them. If you're not sure, hit them. Let's pray. Um, <laughs> key matchups. It's my favorite. That's quite all right. Key- <laughs> um, key matchups. I think Judon on a boy, he's a big one. It's just a big one for Zach Wilson to get comfortable in this game. It's a big one that the Jets are gonna have to scheme around. I think you're gonna see a lot of tight ends to stay in blocking and chips. Um, you know, I think you're gonna see Zach on the move. Uh, overall, I like this Jets offensive line versus Pat's defensive line, kind of the inverse of what we were just talking about. Um, I think you have to like that matchup, but right tackle versus Matt Judon. You, you're worried about that. Um, but yeah, but if Barmore is not playing and I know this offensive line didn't play too well and we'll see, you can't count any chickens before they hatch, but Barmore's not playing. I feel good about the Jets ability to run the football. It's just, can they control Matt Judon? Um, so that's a big matchup. If you have anything else to add on that, what are, what are some other big matchups that, that you'll be paying attention to uh, in this game? Um, I mean, I mean, specifically looking at the Jets offense or, or either one. Uh, either one. Offense or defense, just matchups in, in general. Like we talked about getting the running backs and, and tight ends involved. I mean, you could talk. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot. You could go with really any here. I think Judon versus okay. Okoye, he's the big one on offense to determine how they'll do. But Okay, yeah. So I'll, I'll go back to uh, a topic I was just going over. Uh, Quinn and Williams against the Patriots interior because uh, that that's the strength of the Patriots offense, I think, is that interior offensive line. And then Quinn and Williams is one of the greatest strengths of the Jets' defense. So – if Quinn and Williams can be his usual self, I think the Jets are going to couple that with good edge pressure against these tackles, and it really could cause a lot of trouble for New England. But if this Patriots interior is good enough to maybe hold Quinn into his first quiet game in a long time, then it could get things clicking a little bit for the Patriots. Their run game could get going. Um, Mac Jones could have room to step up and throw the ball deep. Even if there's edge pressure, you want to have that interior pressure to complement it to squeeze in that pocket uh, and not allow escape lanes to develop. So Quinn Williams, huge game for him against this interior trio for the Patriots, which I think is pretty good. And then looking at, uh, you know, the center spot for the Patriots, David Andrews, like I said, he's up in the air. If he plays, it's a great interior trio. If he doesn't play, then their backup, uh, James Ferentz is a guy who the Jets beat up in the 2020 game. Um, Foley Fadakasi was scorching him in the passing game, and that's not something that happens a lot. So it, it would be a huge, huge mismatch if uh, David Andrews is out, and Quinn Williams would have a chance to do massive damage. So either way, I think Quinn huge. He either has to mitigate the greatest strength of this offense, or he has to absolutely dominate a very favorable matchup. All right, where are the Jets better? We've done this every week, Michael, but there's probably, I mean... I don't want to say no week that I've been looking forward to this more than this one. We're going to try to not be biased here. We'll try to be level-headed here. And with that said, we're going to give the Jets every single position here. But I think this is a nice little reality check for at least on paper. And it, it'll come down to coaching. It always does with, with Belichick. He seems to be able to win with anybody. But on paper, the Jets are the better team. So let's just go ahead and dive into this. I think quarterback off the bat, the Jets quarterbacks have not been playing too well. The Pats have a bit of a quarterback controversy, but they've gotten better production from that position it's hard to say either way but if i were a pats fan i would say it's pretty clear right now that the the patriots are getting better quarterback play as bad as it's been just you can't you can either go push or patriots here i'm not saying that i don't think that zach wilson can and and won't um outplay mac jones or bailey zap i think that there's a very realistic chance that could happen but you know we're trying not to be too biased here so michael i'll give you the decision on this one do you give it to the patriots do you give it to the jets or do you give it to a, a you know a wash or a push? Yeah, I'm 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 sorry. I have to give it to the Pats. 
Yeah, I know. Until I, proven I, otherwise, yeah. I think you have to give it that's to us. That's how this has to work. Um, running back. Both teams have had success with the running game. The Jets lose, obviously. I mean, if Brees Hall is healthy, this isn't even a question. But Brees Hall goes down. You trade for James Robinson. We haven't really seen him in the Jets uniform yet, but we know what the Jets have in Michael Carter. On the flip side of the things, on the flip side of things, though, Patriots have had great success with their running game and Ramondre Stevenson. And, and how do you feel that those two, you know, groups match up? both of them are pretty strong have two good running backs that you can feel comfortable with and Damian Harris and Ron Ramondre Stevenson and for the Jets Michael Carter and James Robinson uh who do you give uh the, the edge to in this one I, I think this is a wash I think these are both two solid duos I think these are very similar all right talented groups let's go wash all right we'll go wash on that one I think that's that's a fair analysis receiver I don't think this is close in my eyes I mean it's hard because I know the receivers haven't put up crazy numbers, but I think if, if you're a Pats fan and you're saying you wouldn't rather have Elijah Moore, Garrett Wilson, Corey Davis, and Braxton Berrios, you're lying. So I'm going Jets with this one. Yeah, we'll give this to the Jets. Tight end. How do you feel? Mm, Jets. Care, care to elaborate or just mm, Jets? Well, I mean – Hunter Henry hasn't done much this year. John Smith barely does anything. I mean, not that the Jets tight end schedule don't passes either, but all right. If would you rather have I don't know? I guess they are similar in that they have a duo like the Jets do. Would you trade but... Tyler Conklin and CJ Zama for Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry? Reality. This, check. Might, this might be another wash. Yeah. All right. Well, offensively, these two teams aren't too different so far. Um, I think we split it into offensive tackle and interior offensive line. Offensive tackle. Uh, Jets got Dwayne Brown and and Cedric Obwehi. The only thing that gives me Pat pause Trent is like Brown what I just it. brought up for you. Like these guys, on paper, that Patriots should be way better, but you know, just because the investments. But these guys have really struggled this year. I think you have to give it to them though. The Jets are on their sixth <laughs> tackle. Yeah, all right, fair enough. That's so just being fair. Interior offensive line. Um, Jets lose AVT, but they still have Lake and Tomlinson. Uh, my favorite player, Connor McGovern. Patriots. Nate Herbie. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, all right, so the Patriots definitely won the offense on that. I mean, maybe not definitely, but they got quarterback tackle and interior. The Patriots got quarterback and offensive line. The Jets got receiver. We pushed at, at running back and tight end. But when you go to the defense, Michael, let's start with uh, – how do we want to do this? Just interior defensive line, edge, line uh, – yeah, let's do it. Um, we've, we've kind of changed it. I think a few different times, but this is the best way to do it. I would say, let's start defensive tackle. There's no chance you can give this to anybody else. The jets have a guy who's playing better than pretty much every other defensive tackle in football. So you got to give it to Quentin Williams. Good, good player. Next one. And Rankins Rankins has been great. And he's a guy who got a lot of heat on this podcast and his run defense is horrible last year. And he wasn't the pass rusher that he was last year, but he's been awesome this year. And then you can maybe even kind of count JFM. Uh, speaking of JFM edge, you got Carl Lawson, I guess we count JFM as an edge. Um, you obviously a very deep group. Jermaine Johnson would be back. Michael Clemens, Bryce Huff. I probably should have led with him. Jacob Martin. Um, and then on the Pat side of things, I mean, obviously a different system. So not as much a uh, hand in the dirt, but you got Judon. You got, I mean, that uh, Uchi, I think, doesn't he rush sometimes? And I mean, I, I don't really, I guess, do you count like Lawrence Guy and Dietrich Wise as, as edge for them? The three, four defensive ends? Yeah, I mean... I think you give it to the Jets. It's harder. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Judon is probably the best player of these two groups. He's leading the league in sacks right now. Oh, that's eight and a half. But I think the Jets as a whole, though. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's that's a good point, though. If I was a Pats fan, I might be kind of mad about that one. But as a whole, and you look at the depth that they've gotten, and if you add up the Jets sacks they've gotten from that edge position, I mean, I feel like the Jets edge wreaks more havoc on the game than the Pats do with with Matt Judon I feel like that's a a fair assessment but you're right Judon is probably the best player of that group but we'll give the Jets defensive tackle an edge linebacker I mean Jets linebackers are balling out this year as all the concerns we had entering in the season I mean they've been Quan Alexander what a pickup he's been Quincy Williams is um you know made significant strides and TJ Mosley's holding down the fort and clearly the leader of this team I mean I I think you got to give this one let's go Jets. Jets Yeah, I, I was. Stopping. I talked about earlier their uh, their struggles covering running backs. I think that boils down to linebacker. 
Um, I guess we'll go corners first. You know, look, the Pats have a great secondary and they have great corners, but there's just no chance you could give this to anybody but the Jets the way that Sauce right. Gardner and TJ Reed and Michael Carter the second are playing. And now even throwing Brandon Eccles because every time he goes in, I know he's given up a few plays, but he's looked uh you know, shout out to DJ Bienemy when he's in the pod. He was he was saying that the Jets staff believes in Eccles more than Hall and certainly been proven right. Um and that was a year ago, so it sounded a little crazy at the time. Uh safety. I mean, Joyner and Whitehead, kind of a tough start to the season, rebounded, still have made a few negative plays, but overall I would say the safeties have been pretty solid for the Jets. But the Pats got McCourty. Uh, I don't know if Duggar's playing. They have real Peppers. Yeah, I mean, I'm look, I'm just looking at their numbers right now, trying to see how they've been doing. Uh, four touchdowns to one interception this season. Not a lot of missed tackles, though, which is good. And no penalties, so – I don't know, but their past defense hasn't been as amazing as usual. A lot of this is kind of presumptuous without watching them, but uh, I don't know. Well, we, I mean, we've seen, I've seen enough of them to know that their past defense isn't as as good as yeah. usual. And honestly, and the two, their two big I mean, wins were Browns and Lions. I mean, right. Say what you want the about Jets the Jets. Safeties, they were a big weakness three games into the year, but last four games, I mean, it's been pretty solid. I don't know, maybe this is a wash. All right, let's do – we'll give them a wash on that. Special teams, we'll just lump them all in together. Kicker, punter, kick returner, they're all one position, and I don't care because it doesn't matter. The Jets definitely win this one. And, look, special teams, we, we made this point at like two weeks ago or something, but when you're a bad team, it's like, oh, okay, cool, Braxton Barris returned a kickoff return or whatever. Oh, this stupid kicker missed or whatever. They, it definitely makes a difference between winning and losing when you're – One of the last two games. It's one of the last two games. Braden May yeah. has certainly turned it around. He had that down punt inside the one. Obviously, the onside kick against Cleveland won in that game. Uh, blocked punt against uh, Green Bay and a blocked field goal. I mean, the special teams. Contributed the in Miami, too, to set up the safety. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, wait. How did they set up this? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you're right. And, you know, Barrios had a nice return in that game. Barrios is getting closer and closer to popping a big one. Um, so you have to love the job that Brant Boyer has done with this, with this unit. So final tally, Michael, you ready? Offensively, you got to give it to the Pats. We are running quarterback tight end and interior offensive line. The Jets got receiver and we pushed at running back and tight end. So that's three, one to the Jets or it's three, one to the Pats. But defensively, we gave everything to the Jets, defensive tackle, edge, linebacker, corner safety was a wash and the Jets got special teams. So what that says is the Patriots might be slightly better offensively up until this point, which I think is fair. But defensively, the Jets are playing significantly better than the Patriots. And I think that's also fair to say. So I think that was actually a pretty accurate representation right now of, of how these two teams are playing. You could, if you're a Pats fan, you could maybe, you could argue edge maybe with Judon, to, you know, because he's been so good. But I think that's really the only one that you could argue. And even then, the Jets would still have the, the numbers advantage on this one. So these two teams clearly... On paper, they're not that far apart in terms of like, it's not the same old Jets for the Patriots. Um, are the Jets leaving the Pats in the dust? No, I still think this is a tough game. We'll just say go right into predictions. Um, but the Jets are better. The Jets are the better team. And it's going to come down to coaching. And it's going to come down to execution. It's going to come down to Zach Wilson. Uh, and can this defense keep things going? But on paper, this, this, this Jets team is certainly better than the Pats team. But it's not like a blowout. I mean, the Pats are still will be hanging around uh, come December in the wild card race. Uh, and so they play them two of the next three games. So, you know, even if they lose this one, they have to be ready to roll in Gillette. And if they win this one, they can't be Billy strutting around the, the stadium because they got to play them bills by, and then they're back in New England. So Michael, with that said, score prediction. And, and if, you know, if you have a random prediction, I, again, I swear I say I'm going to write them down every week and I do write them down and they're not here in the dock. Every week I've said we're going to write down these the random predictions, and they're not in here. Are you just going in and deleting them? Is that what's happening? What was ours yeah, last I, week? I just we, I just delete them because I usually get them wrong. No, I don't know. We I mean, had a few, didn't we? I mean, we had a uh, – before the game, I tweeted Tyler Conklin touchdown, which was wrong. But I think on the pod – Oh, uh, my, I had a Jeff Smith – I don't think I said it on the podcast, but I, I did say I thought Jeff Smith was going to pass in this game. It did not happen. Friend of the pod, kind of. Listener named Jeff Smith, so that counts. Um, I guess, all right, well, I'll give it to you for first. I mean, how do you see this one playing out? And then maybe 
talk it through. Best Did I do a score prediction case. last week? Didn't I kind of like dodge doing a score prediction? I don't remember that. I remember. Um, I remember. I, I think I, I went a little hot. No, you Did gave I say like a low scoring Bronc yeah. uh, Jets win. I think I ended up having it. This right, I, I will predict the score for this week. I got one. Uh, all right, go ahead. Jets thirty, Patriots thirteen. Wow. All righty, Michael. I like it. All right. All right. So we'll talk us through it. Talk us through what you're thinking, what you're feeling, uh, what the best case scenario for the Jets looks like, what a worst case scenario looks like for the Jets. I mean, in terms of like how the game is unfolding. Um, but talk us, walk us through your prediction here. That's that's a that's a bold call for you. We don't never normally hear the, the blowouts coming come from you, Michael. Um, but yeah, let me hear it. No, I mean, I, I kind of like the matchup actually. I think the Jets are gonna be able to run the ball. I think the Patriots play a style that, look, the downside is absolutely there. If Zach Wilson isn't dialed in, it could get ugly. We saw it last year. They're designed to exploit bad quarterback play, especially young quarterbacks. So the downside is there. But it also presents upside, I think. And I think it presents the type of upside Zach Wilson needs right now, which is um, inviting the quarterback to be aggressive. And So I think he's going to – take shots in this game. And I really see him having his sort of breakout game this year. I think it's going to be a successful day. Um, uh, there's, that's contingent on a lot of things, the pass protection, how does Elijah Moore play? How is he used? But I think the jets are going to figure it out. I think this team overall is very motivated for this game, especially defensively. Uh, just listening to them talk about last year and how you know they ran up the score on them and how many players are looking forward to this game over Sounded like he was very fired up for this game. I think the team is very, very locked in for this game. So I, I really think they're going to come. They're going to come out and have a great performance. I agree. You know, uh, surprise. I'm predicting a win. Although I, I, you know, I think I've predicted. I predicted a loss against the Ravens, and I think that's the only game I've gotten. Or I think, sorry, I think the Bengals. I predicted that to be a win, and that was a loss. And I think it's the only one I've gotten wrong so far. I mean, granted, the Jets have won every game. I think the Dolphins game initially I predicted a loss and then came back around and said 49 nothing. But uh not that any of that matters because these predictions are completely arbitrary and so will these random predictions be. But I I tend to agree with you Michael. I mean, I don't want to just copy your score, but I feel like it's a kind of a similar type of game where I think the Jets will kind of get out to an early lead uh and then run the football, play good defense, and I just I think that the Jets will win this by more than two possessions. I don't I, 30 to 13 sounds pretty damn good, Michael. I'll I'll lower it a little bit. Um my random prediction is I think Elijah Moore gets a touchdown. I think they'll give him a, a TD. I think him and Carter will both score. Uh, that's not too crazy, I guess. How about this? Ready? Here's here's my uh here's my uh three person TD parlay. Put it down. Okay. Elijah Moore, Michael Carter, James Robinson. I think Robinson punches something in from the one. I think Carter get some sort of swing pass or something and he scores. And I think Elijah Moore gets a pretty considerable touchdown, like a 20 yard touchdown or something like that. Something along those lines. And so maybe another Zerlon field goal or something, and maybe two of them. So I'll say 27 and I'll give the Pats. I don't know. 27 to 13 is such a, it's calling me 27 to 13. So I just went pretty much the exact same score as you, but minus All one. All right, I'll go with my three, uh, three-person three touchdown parlay. Okay, or other random predictions too, but let me hear it. All right, here, here's mine. Oh, definitely going to match you with Michael Carter, but I'm going to go with Garrett Wilson instead of Elijah Moore. Okay. And then listen to this one, DJ Reed. Wow, okay. If that, Hey, if yeah. DJ Reed gets a pick six, that's a good point. He didn't think about that. I didn't think about that. Uh, turnovers and who gets who gets what i think uh i mean look these are all la la land at this point but <laughs> i think carl lawson gets a sack i think uh yeah i think carl lawson gets a sack i think quinn williams gets a sack i think sauce Gardner gets an interception um you all get a happens. sack and you get a sack no but i do think this jets defense is going to come out ready to play i mean kind of to your point i think this team is is motivated they have something to prove you know their injuries really sucked but at the same time it, there's there's no really qualifying it to make it seem better than it is but at the same time this this jets team is not going to sleep on this pats team they're not going to stroll in hey we're five and two you know this is a team with something to prove they faced a lot of adversity the last week and they want to show it they're five and two they want to show that they're the second best team in this division maybe the best team in this division that's for next week um, and that the Patriots time is over. 
run in this division. So I think this defense is going to come, you know, I, I think they're going to, uh, you know, create the big explosive plays that this defense really um, predicates itself on. They may allow some yards or whatever, but they'll create the big sack, the strip sack, the, the interception, the stop on fourth downs. That's what this defense is predicate holding in the red zone, holding him to three. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think this Jets defense will come ready to play. And the thing is, is as much as we want to say, okay, this is the biggest game of Zach Wilson's career. And, and I do think that's true. I think if Zach Wilson has a, a good game here, hell, a, a, you know, a breakout game, obviously, but even just a good game, it will do a lot for me. And I do a lot for, for the fans perception of, of him as a, as the future quarterback. But I will say, I do think they can win with Zach Wilson, not carrying him. I, do I think he can be, I think he has to be a little bit better than he, I think he has to be better than he was last week. Um, but I think they could win if he plays similarly to green Bay. I know that wasn't a great game, but, um, I really do think this is the type of game where they can lean on, on their defense in the run game again. Um, but you'd love to see Zach Wilson have that breakout against Belichick. It would just be so beautiful. And Michael, you and I will be there. It might be your last game of the year. We'll see. Maybe a home playoff game will bring you back, but we're hoping uh, you're one and one right now. That Dolphins game will be pretty hard to top, but if the Jets go and blow out the Pats 30 to 13, I think we might have to move this one above it. Who knows? We'll see. Um, you can follow us at CYJ Pod on Twitter. Myself, Ben W. Blessington, Michael underscore Michael, Michael underscore Nania. Um, Jets X Factor. Check out all the content there. Best best place to go for Jets content. Uh, subscribe to the Jets X Factor YouTube. Check us out on iTunes, please. Uh, rate, review, subscribe. Really helps the pod out. And Michael, you didn't think we were going to get out of here without talking uniforms, did you? I actually forgot. I'm glad you brought it back up. The debut. The debut. Black helmets. They look pretty great at practice with that that green chrome face mask we'll see how they look in, in uniform we'll be there in person and we can we'll see they wear them three times this year but this is the first one we're either dressing up for for mac jones or zach wilson's funeral that will be uh determined on sunday but how do you feel about them well i don't think we talked about them enough when they came out because i think we we were kind of not doing the pod for a few weeks there so i don't know if we really got to fully analyze these uniforms i'm sure we'll have more post-game thoughts but well i mean typically i'm a fan of shinier helmets instead of matte helmets which, which this one is um but i don't know i think it kind of works because it kind of matches the because like the black of the uniform they use is kind of like not it's it's kind of like a grayish slight slightly what? gray kind of dull black you know what i mean yeah, oh, Especially black is sunlight. dull the color black is dull Michael. i know i'm just saying it's not like compared to the ravens acrylic or the black? saints you know what i mean like compared to the ravens or the no, saints I, think... I feel like they're a sharper black so I feel like the matte black helmet kind of matches that a little bit better. I think it's the same freaking color. It's just what's, a, you know, the other colors in the uniform. But I, I agree with you that I agree with you that the uh, uh, I like shinier helmets more. But we all know that the 80s logo has to be the logo of this franchise. All right, maybe my explanation it. was wrong, but what I'm trying to say is generally I don't like matte helmets, but I this think it works. kind of works here for some. It reason. also works. It also works like, hey, like fighter jet stealth stealth I, I like it. It, it it we'll see how it looks i liked the all black with the green helmets but this might end up looking sharper um we'll see how the the, the green word i mean look the, the logo isn't great but i the think more they win my complaint it, it kind of like i don't know it feels like the white outline is maybe too prominent it like stands out too much looks kind we have of to see it. we have to see it in the field I, I the only thing i would say is is the green this look hey we, we already did the plug so if you're still here you can't complain if the green <laughs> jets doesn't match with the white New York across the Jersey. That's, that's what you have to, to look out for. But I think, uh, look, the, the word, the clip art logo is, is looks better now that they're winning, but the eighties logo needs to be the, this franchise's uh, official logo. Uh, they'll have the, the throwback unis next year reportedly. Uh, and then I think the year after that, they can change their uniforms full time. I actually, I don't, I know some people don't like the New York across the front and the contra or whatever. I don't mind the uniform. It's just, if you just slap the eighties logo on these current uniforms, I'd be all about it. All right, let's do it. Um, it's just the, the clip out, the clip art logo. I don't, I don't love, but Hey, more they win better. It looks all right. That's enough uniform talk. Um, Hey, I mean, a little bit of the Batman voice come in there. I gotta say that Batman impression might be coming back on Sunday. Cause I'll be screaming my head off at MetLife. So we'll see black uniforms. Does the dark Knight return? Uh, I'll probably lean into it a little bit more really just stick with it and sacrifice you know i had a, I had a if they win this game we have to call it the dark night rises especially because the black uniforms it's i'm perfect. with it 
I'm with it. You saw I changed the uh, the name from the last Batman podcast to Holy Blowout Batman. So that was kind of funny. Get it? Like, yeah. All right, whatever. No, I got um, it. No, you got it. Okay, cool. We'll see. I'll try not to. I'll try to save the voice um, for, for, for the Pats game. But if Batman has to come out, Batman has to come out. Um, I guess that's it. We're done. Let's get out of here. Thank you for listening. Everybody, enjoy your weekend. Uh, if you're going out Wait, to the Jets game. Oh, I, I got something to say. I got something okay. to say. Yeah, hit me. If, if you're debating going to this game, go to this game. Fill nice. it up. Keep the Pats fans out. I want this to be the most packed game in MetLife Stadium history for the Jets. The loudest game in MetLife Stadium history for the Jets. Let's do it. We've been waiting for this so long. The Jets are good. Yeah. They're playing the Pats. They're making a play to compete in the AFC. They win this game. Next week, they're playing for the number one seed in the conference. Think about that. In That's November. Insane. That's insane. Think can, you ima- that. can you imagine if they won that game and then the Jets are the number one seed in the AFC? They upset the – all right, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But Let's not get yeah, ahead of ourselves. The fact, but it- the fact that they're in this position is – because even when the Jets were uh, good in the Rex, Rex days, they played the Pats at home week two. So both right. – like 2009, they were 1-0, and then 2010, they were 0-1. The 5-2 and two at home against the pats has not happened since i've been watching i mean obviously five and two is arbitrary but meaning like a, a winning team we're above the pats in the division at home like you said michael we've been waiting for this opportunity for so long even with this in the injuries this jets team is is still has a ton of fun players to root for and they're still a good and talented team so i'm very excited for sunday so like michael said if you're debating get out to the game it's a nice sunny day yeah. it might be the nice kind of sunny nice weather football game of the season nice football so. weather Definitely, definitely make sure to get out to MetLife uh, this Sunday. Get out there. This is it. This is why you're a fan. This is why you're still listening to this podcast two hours in, however long we're into this. Yeah, get Listening out to there. me talk about Matt Helmets and the Patriots yards per carry against 11 personnel. This is why you listen <laughs> to that. So get into MetLife Stadium. Get into the air conditioner. Yeah. Join the AC unit. I was going to think, uh, you know, what? if Brees was still playing, we could do like kind of like a pun on Brees, like Brees. All right. I'm, I'm bombing today. It has potential. Um, yeah, that's potential. We got we to gotta workshop that one. All right. Thank you for listening, everybody. Have a great weekend. Go Jets.